Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everybody to the June 26th Oklahoma City Planning Commission meeting. And uh, first order of business, if you have cell phones, pagers, or similar electronic devices, if you would turn those off or silence them now, we would appreciate that. If you are not the applicant and you have come to talk to us about a case today, uh, we have sign-up sheets. They look like this. They're on the uh, table right outside the chambers. If you would complete it for the case you would like to address us on, we'd be happy to hear you when we discuss the case. And the first thing we're going to do today is have a resolution. James Williams, who has been the Ward 7 Commissioner for longer than I can remember, uh, has served his last meeting, and we have a resolution for him today, which Aubrey will read. Okay, whereas James Williams has splendidly served the citizens of this community as the Ward 7 Planning Commissioner from December 14, 1995 to June 12, 2014, and whereas James Williams' fulfillment of his responsibilities was achieved with a heartfelt dedication to the well-being of the community, and whereas James Williams brought a unique perspective as an architect and as a developer of numerous projects in Oklahoma City, and whereas James Williams was instrumental in the update of the OKC Plan 2000 to 2020, and whereas during James Williams' tenure, numerous comprehensive plan amendments were approved by the Planning Commission, including four sector plans, six corridor plans, and five special area plans. And whereas James Williams played an important role in the adoption of new guidelines and policies to improve the appearance of Oklahoma City, and whereas James Williams has served as a member of the Citizen Advisory Team for Oklahoma City's new comprehensive plan, Plan OKC, and whereas James Williams consistently treated all individuals he encountered, whether citizens or staff, with respect and courtesy. Now therefore be it resolved that James Williams is hereby commended by the Planning Commission for over 19 years of service to the community as a member of this body. I just want to say, James, on behalf of the Commission, and certainly personally, it's been a privilege to work with you for all these years, to have you as a colleague, to consider you a wonderful close friend. It's been a real pleasure, and we will miss you. Thank you. You know, today, I, I, you know, you get programmed over a number of years of just habits that you do every other Thursday, just certain things you do. So I was leaving this morning, and I almost turned around because I said, boy, I forgot my packet. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't. But I, what I'd like to say to the to, to commission and to the staff and to the engineers and the, uh, applicants, it's been a real pleasure serving. Uh, I didn't know what a pleasure would be when I started out, but it's been a pleasure to be able to share my gifts and talents and and be able to be a part of this development of this renaissance of this new city, and especially Ward 7. I, I have a great passion for that. So thank you all for it. Thank uh, the commission. I've made really good friendships. We have a good chemistry. We have one of the best commissions uh, over the 19 years I've seen. It has evolved into a great commission and doing a great work here. So I'd just like to say thank you to all my friends, and we will see you down the road, and we wish the best to the uh, new commissioner. Uh, Mr. Lee Cooper, we uh, ask that you uh, serve and enjoy your service, and we'll always appreciate what you do. Thank you. James has been an honor to serve with you. Uh, I, I'm, I'm honored also to count you as a good and close friend. I've expected. Uh, uh, appreciated your your spirit um, on the horseshoe as we work together and um, your ability to kind of keep us all under the uh, off the ledge if you will um, but uh, I personally am going to miss you as a friend and uh, I, I appreciate your service and dedication to the city and Ward 7. Thanks a lot. Thank you. 
James, we'd be here all afternoon if I said all the nice things I could say about you. But I really have just learned so much from you during my time on the commission. I just really, really appreciate your expertise and your insight and your heart. And I know you'll stay plenty busy and that we'll get to see you now and then, but we will really miss you. Thank you. James, I just ditto everything that's been said so far, and I, I really do appreciate the friendship. Uh, I uh, appreciate the camaraderie. Uh, and most of all, I appreciate your expertise in what you brought to the Planning Commission. Thank you very much. Thank you. There's a reoccurring theme going here around the table that you do bring a different perspective. And um, as I mentioned before, it's a, it's, a, it's a group of people that brings different perspective to this process. And we've really appreciated having that expertise with you and just your heart and your compassion for doing the right thing and making Oklahoma City the best place to live has been such a joy to watch you know, over the years. And I've really appreciated kind of growing up in the planning department with you being that consistent presence for us. And I hope that you'll come and do great work and we'll see you here at Planning Commission and we can make faces at you from back here when we're off camera. Okay. <laughs> Jim, it's been a pleasure uh, working with you. Uh, hard to believe it's been 19 years, but uh, we enjoyed, I enjoyed working with you and I uh, hope you have a, you know, Good success in this, whatever else you do. Thank you. One of the benefits when I came on the commission was sitting here by you, learning from your dedication to your profession, architecture, your developing skills, etc. But the best thing is the friendship that you and I have acquired over these years, which will never go away. It's there for a long, long time. And I just appreciate how you contributed to the working of this planning commission in many, many areas that really has coalesced to where we really have some good stuff going on for the benefit of the city, and a lot of that's attributable to you. And thank you, James. Thank you much. Mr. Williams, let me say thanks for your tremendous service over the years. I've had opportunity to observe you through the years and how you have helped this city to grow and come with I want to thank you for your tremendous service, and uh, I know that you're not uh, moving off the scene. You're just moving to do some better and greater things, and so we look forward to seeing you coming back. Thank you. James, I'm last in line. Uh, I've had the honor of sitting next to you for 19 years. Yeah. You've been a great planning commissioner, better friend. Uh, your service has uh, not gone unnoticed made a tremendous contribution over those 19 years. I appreciate it, and I'm certain the city appreciates it. Thank, Thank you, you much. Thank you, James. Thank you. For everything you've been to all of us. Okay. And thank all of you again. And I have a friend that says he's like a bad cold. He'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioners, we need uh, a motion to approve the resolution for James. Move a resolution. Second. Okay, a motion and a second to approve the resolution. Cast your votes, and it is approved. Uh, next thing I'd like to do is welcome Lee Cooper. Uh, I hope everyone who works with us on the commission, staff, applicants, and citizens will give Lee the same warm welcome, consideration that he, that James has enjoyed over the years and that we all receive. We're really looking forward to working with you, Lee, and we're real happy to have you with us. Thank you very much. Second. I, excuse, I abstain, but I have a correction in the minutes. I, <laughs> this is really funny. I wasn't here last meeting, so I abstained. And while I spent any time at all reading the minutes, I'll never know, but on page four, item number 16, I have seconded the motion to approve whatever that application was, and I wasn't here. <laughs> Reverse osmosis. Well, I, you know, I mean, I was here, so I read them. Bob, we did it in your honor. Huh? We did it that in your honor. I bet you did it on purpose. That revision. 
Well, we need a motion with that revision. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the minutes. Cast your votes. And they're approved. Next item is continuances. Okay, we have five uncontested requests. It would be item B12, which is CE 879, has been deferred to July 10th. Item B20, C6598, deferred to August 14th. Item B21, PUD 1545, deferred to July 10th. Item B22, CE 844, deferred to July 10th. And item B23, SP 468, deferred to August 14th. Did anyone come here today to talk to us about any of the items just read? Move the uncontested continuance. We have a motion to second to approve the uncontested continuances. Cast your votes, and they're approved. We have two new requests for continuance. It would be item B7, which is C6625, to defer to July 10th, and item B17, which is PUD 1535, to defer to July 10th. I need to find my copy of B17. Is that your case, Brian? Yes. Uh, when that comes back to us, it needs to come back with uh, some changes, which Nick and I can talk to you about before we go forward with it. Okay. Uh, any other discussion on either of those two items? Take a motion. Move, so move uh, uh, on any request for continuances. Second. We have a motion and a second to uh, continue item 7 and 17. Cast your votes. Those are approved. Are there any continuance requests from the public today? Hearing none, we'll do the consent docket. Okay, there are four items on consent. Item 1 is C6623, the final plat of Mustang Ridge, Phase 1, located south of 44th Street and east of Chuck Hall Road. Item 2 is C6627, the final plat of Shadow Edition located north of Southwest 15th and west of Mustang Road. Item three is PUD 1281A for specific plan for PUD 1281, located at 14621 Mezzaluna Avenue. And item four is ABC 812, which is an ABC1 overlay of the PUD 302 district, located at 15001 North May. Anyone come here today to discuss any of those items, one through four with us? Motion. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent docket. Cast your votes, and that's approved. Moving on to items requiring a separate vote, item five is SPD, SPUD 768 to rezone 33 Northwest 144th Circle from PUD 759 to SPUD 768. Is the applicant here? Give us your name and address for the record, please. My name is Keith Brunnels. The address is 33 Northwest 144th Circle. Thank you. And your application is for a church and a parking lot adjacent to it, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. No one signed up, commissioners. Any comments, Lee? No. Okay. Have approval of the application? Second. Okay, we have a motion and second to approve item five. Cast your votes. And you're approved. Thank you. Thank you. Item 6 is SPUD 769 to rezone 10549 Northwest 10th Street from SPUD 717 to SPUD 769. My name is Jason Powers. Uh, the address is 10549 Northwest 10th Street. Tell us what you're trying to do, please. We, we have an existing building, and uh, we're just trying to add some more uses for a future lease. And Jason, is the participant recreation issue, Mike, that you Right. Um, the participant recreation, uh, I, I don't know that I'd particularly fond of that use in this 
particular area. The rest of them, I think, are are conducive and, and or compatible at least with the rest of the area. I don't think participant recreation is is is, is one of those. Would you agree to delete that use? I, I agree. I mean, that's that's fine to take okay. that off. All right. Um, no one signed up. Any questions? Okay. Um, all right. Hearing that, then we'll I'll move approval of the application deleting the participant recreation use. Second the motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve item six, deleting the participant recreation use. Cast your votes. That's approved. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Item seven was deferred. Item eight is SP 472 for a special permit to operate an automobile dealership located at 3216 North May Avenue. My name is Sam Gresham here to represent the owner. Our request is for a special permit for an auto dealership, uh, which is in this location uh, fairly common. No one, it's in Janice's area, but it's in my neighborhood. Speak. <laughs> you know, it's right there. I go by this all the time. And and while this, you know, it's just a, a, for a special permit. Yes. Already zone C3. Yes. No PUD, no, you know. But, That's right. But with what I, when I read the application, Sam, that the landscaping, the closing off of driveways, the, the way that this is described, it's going to be a vast improvement over most of this stuff that's between 30th and 36th on May Avenue. I mean, I can, agree. can I have your assurance that you're really going to do what it is that you've well, done? We're compelled to, obviously, for the sake of building a, a building permit. But and you've got eight foot monument signs? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's all, square all this feet. kind of fits in an area that you take a picture of the signage from. 23rd Street going north, and it's a forest of bad signs and bad architecture and bad building materials. And I applaud you for, you know, for doing what you're doing with this application, even though I don't have any way in the world to enforce what it is you're going to be doing because it's not a PUD. This is a straight special permit and straight, you know, you can do it. But I just encourage you, your client, to do what it is you've drawn. We're compelled to, and we will do that. I'll yes. drive by it, believe me. <laughs> Turn us in. The, the two things that I have concerns about for this type of use at this specific location um, are lighting, because most car lots are lit up like daylight at midnight. And it is relatively close to the residential area to the east. Mm -hmm. Um, and then um, noise. Um, I know probably cell phones have replaced the old-fashioned outdoor loudspeakers that used to, um, and you know, just haunt people in, that lived in the area of car dealerships. But I, I would like some assurances with respect to those two things. In terms of light, lights only on the building. Uh, if pole lights uh, shine, we're 250 feet from the back of the property to the nearest residence. It's it's quite a distance down 32nd Street. Uh, in terms of lighting, uh, the adjacent building to the north, which is the, I guess it's the family dollar, has more light on it than, than we would have. The pole lights in the yard and so It won't be lit up like the dealership that's up there on the corner of 39th and May. Oh, no. Can... Oh, well, I was a Ford dealership. They have more money. So, uh... <laughs> <laughs> and, and outdoor... Um, no, there's no speakers. I, I, well, like you say, it's it's not done with intercoms as far uh, you know most most attendees. People who come to look are uh, are uh, it's a fairly low volume of traffic because it's a fairly small lot. Um, so the activity is is limited, uh, and 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 loudspeakers or any kind of of, of noise. I, I've never recognized that it. it's noisy. I've seen it, but I've not seen it in this condition. Uh, we do have done other dealerships. We did Mercedes-Benz, Volvo, all those places over there. And they don't do that either. I mean, you know, it's a sort of restrained, kind of quiet activity, if I could describe it as that. Okay. So. I'm going to hold you to it. And is there anybody who has signed up to be heard on this? No. I'll move approval. We have a motion and second to approve item 8. Cast your votes. And you're approved. Thank, Thank you, you very much. 
Item 9 is C6622, the final plat of Montebella, located west of Westminster Road and south of Southeast 59th Street. Jeff Johnson, 19 Northeast 3rd. Okay. Tell us about your application, please. Uh, basically, it's a subdivision, one acre lots, in southeast Oklahoma City. Uh, I've read staff reports. Uh, we are okay with all staff reports or issues on the with staff, except for three and four. Um, the 25 foot setback is uh, taking away the use of some of the lots in the neighborhood, and it's, it's due to some pipeline type easements and things like that is what's causing the restrictions. But um, they, we were proposing maybe, they said we, we could do no setback, but we'd need to sprinkle as an option to sprinkle those houses. So we were proposing to sprinkle the ones that would not meet the 25 foot set, side yard setback. How many would that affect? How many lots would that affect? We think it would only be like three. Lock, lock two, lock Sir, six. Sir, come, come to the microphone and give us your name, please. My name is Derek Millick, and I'm with JGVE, um, and I'm the consultant okay. for this project that is on. Um, block two, lot six, and I guess you're, when you say three, you're thinking lot one, two? Maybe one of those. In, in block two. Mm -hmm. So in block two, we have lots one and six, and then in block one, it would be uh, lot seven. So... Eric, are you the one I spoke to on the phone? Yes. Okay. There's a couple of things that I, did, did you ever determine what the process is going to be on that next phase? How far out are you looking? I, and I know that's kind of a, a hypothetical, but um, it concerns me a little bit. We would like uh, to move as fast as the market obviously would allow. Yeah. Uh, I don't know whether the fire department's looked at this or not, and I know it's going to be uh, private streets, and I believe you told me gated. Is that correct? correct. Okay. Um, but there's there's quite a few houses in there. Uh, when the, uh, the next phase comes about, and I would be um, I would ask you to sprinkle the whole subdivision um, because of that. Um, I, 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 and I know there's some problems with sprinkling houses. Uh, I know, you know, we've been told one thing, and I think it's been uh, brought to our attention that some of those things weren't exactly uh, correct. Um, but I still think uh, in a subdivision like this where if you, you know, if you've got a problem in the back part of that subdivision, uh, and you got cars parked in the way or something like that, uh, it's going to be tough for a fire truck to get down those roads. How many lots ultimately would be in your subdivision when you finished it all out? 50 something? Uh, there's 19 in the first phase. Of well, I understand the first phase, but I mean, beyond that, you've got certainly more than that coming on afterwards. Maybe about 17 in phase two. About 40 some odd. I'd say under, just under 50 lots probably. Yeah, 40, 40, 40 some odd lots, yeah. I think. Which is, on 80 acres, is still pretty low density. I mean, they're going to be spread apart. Yeah. Jim, how serious is water is an issue in this area? I'm sorry? How serious is water as an issue here? You know, it, it, it's, it's you've, you're going to have wells, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it, and you're going to have septic systems. Um, but I just, you know, with the way this thing is configured and, uh, you know, as many lots as there is with one way in and one way out, I just don't think that we're... Uh, doing the right thing by not sprinkling. So if, if we force the consumer to irrigate e each of their homes, we would forego the 25-foot setback, side yard setback? 
well, to a five? And that's, that's the reason for the 25-foot setback. So you have 50-foot separation between houses because of fire. Exactly. Um, one other thing, you know, one other thing that might be done is to use fire coat sheetrock in, in the houses. And I don't know exactly how the fire department feels about that, but that's another way you could probably look at those things as well. But uh, I, I would really feel com more comfortable if uh, we were to sprinkle the whole subdivision. Well, I'm willing to do one or the other, sprinkle them or, and not, not have the 25 yard or foot setback or 25 foot and sprinkle the ones that need it. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's a fair compromise. What, what is, what's your fire suppression plan? Abs absent sprinklers, what, what are you going to do for fire suppression here? Well, there's a fire department just south of there, or just north of there. I'm sorry. What are they going to do for I'm water? Sorry, south. My question is, what are they going to do for water? Uh, well, there's. Are you going to provide a, a water source for the for the subdivision here? Everybody's on their own well, and it's that doesn't different. help people uh -huh. fighting a fire. Yeah, JJ, uh, it isn't it their requirement for a, a, a holding tank or a, a dry fire hydrant. In, in these particular cases. Right, and the, just so you'll know, the lots in the remaining phase of this development are required to be sprinkled. So really, the, you're really only talking about three lots in this first phase. Oh, so the back part's already back required parts, to be sprinkled. You made that a requirement yeah. with your previous approval, so it's, they're required to be sprinkled. With what? And we haven't filed anything on the other plats. So yeah. Oh, was it? Okay. Can't hear you. I'm sorry. I said it sounds like our problem is solved. If the rest of it's sprinkled, right? Yeah. Well, I think it is if he's willing to sprinkle these um, or uh, in exchange yeah. for the 25 foot setback. Well, no, I, I didn't mean these three. I mean the whole. I think he's trading lot sizes for sprinklers and going to. Put more, well, you, you well put the more lot houses. sizes are set. They're all acre plus. Oh, okay. Um, it's just there's it's a setback. few lots that the setback impacted. Okay. How, how so, far, what's the, the distance, what's the maximum distance that you can get on those lots that you can't get 25 foot? It would still be, it would still be 30 plus. Between the houses? Mm -hmm. So you're, you're saying 15 foot? Yes. So Nick on one comment? and 25 on the other, so it'd actually be 40 feet. My only comment, Mr. Chairman, was, and um, you know, we can resolve this part for these lots, 19 lots, by sprinkling or having setbacks or, or whatever. I I don't think this is a final plat, mm -hmm. a very specific. I don't think we can talk about the other area, whether it's now required to be sprinkled or not. We certainly can't require it to be sprinkled now. Right. Uh, so I think we need to address just what's before us, the 19 lots, and uh, either have adequate setback or, uh, or sprinkle them. I can meet staff requirement on all lots but three, which is the 25-foot setback on the side yard. And I... I thought it was a pretty good compromise to offer to sprinkle the ones that don't meet it. Okay. Well, uh, uh, my, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to ask a quick question. Uh, is there a limit to uh, how many you're willing to sprinkle as long as, um, I don't, I'm not, but the final plat that we end up with, so say four or five that need to be sprinkled? Are you willing to do that? Yes, if, if somebody wants to put a house on it, it will not meet the 25-foot setback. I'd say you got to sprinkle it. Yes. But this is the kind of we're trading a setback for a sprinkler, and I think that if the fire department was at that podium right there, the fire department would say, "I want it all sprinkled," because no. they can they can foresee. Even though Nick, you're right, we can't go beyond what it is. But why don't we just say and go through it? If you're willing to sprinkle it, and then we don't worry about setbacks. Why don't we do that? <clears throat> and we're talking about yeah a total of 19 structures here. Right. Uh, right. It's not like we're talking about a 
quarter section subdivision. No, I understand. Uh, so I, yeah, I frankly don't see the, the big deal with sprinkling all 19 of them. Right. I mean, uh, it's just a cost passed to the consumer. It's not a cost to me. I, I would not have a problem if there was only 19 lots. But I know in the future there's going to be more lots. But the back lots already require sprinkling. I understand. Well, that, that, that's true. That's true. Well, but, but again, what's before us today hey, is just these, these 19. I understand And if that. it makes sense, you know, if it makes sense to sprinkle all the ones in the back, and we're going to have to sprinkle three or four of these anyway, I frankly don't see the big deal of sprinkling them all. Uh, I, I'm perfectly fine with that. Well, let's just go with that and wrap okay. it up with a motion. But I would Very also... Motion. Excuse me. Ahead, I, would, I would also like uh, a variance on the 25-foot setback because that's the reason they were implying it on me because of the fire. That's fine. So, so, okay, I'll make a motion to approve the plat with the uh, the sprinkling of the houses that require less than a 25-foot setback. Well, what we're really saying is he, he's agreeing to sprinkle all the houses, and we're waiving the 25-foot setback. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, in the cases where it can't be met, right? You're agreeing to the 25 foot setback, except for those lots where it was well, not Oh, now he wants to take them off. Take them off. Oh, okay. Yeah. If, if and you want to sprinkle them all, I'm okay with sprinkling yeah, them all. I just don't enforce the 25 foot setback yeah. on me. Also, we understand. Okay. I know you did. <laughs> I think we got it. Yeah. Just need to delete yes. the TE regarding the setback and require uh, sprinkler. Delete three and four. Janice. Mm -hmm. Do the minute takers understand the motion? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and wait, did we get a second? Second. Okay. We have a motion to approve item nine as condition, which is eliminating the 25 foot setbacks and sprinkling all 19 houses. Right. That's the motion. Cast your votes. That's approved. Thank you very much. Thanks. Item 10 is C6557, the revised preliminary plat of Council Park, located south of Northwest 150th Street and east of Council Road. Good afternoon. David Box, 522 Colcord Drive. Here on behalf of the applicant, also with me is Anthony Mirzai, who is the applicant, and Kendall Dillon. This is a preliminary plat for approximately 142 acres. And what you've got handed out is a series of two different exhibits, one showing where we will be placing the uh, recreational amenities. We spent a lot of time working with uh, the chairman on the placement of the amenities. And we uh, ended up with several amenities that are more centralized that will allow, uh, no matter where you live within this development, easy access, uh, and multiple amenities that will overlook uh, that great lake that's on the site. The next exhibit deals with TE number two, and TE number two deals with a variance needed for one access point when you have uh, more than 100 lots. What we have is a street stub to the east and a street stub to the south. So once those developments uh, are developed and built out, we will connect and we wouldn't need the variance. Uh, we worked with the uh, fire marshal, and Mr. Wilson is agreeable to allow us 100 lots uh, north of that street stub, which is 145th, if we decide to develop south of that line prior to having a connection to the east or the south, we will have to sprinkle the balance of that, and we are in agreement with that. So we do need the variance, but we, um, we're willing to make that a, that a TE as well, um, and Mr. Wilson is agreeable to that. All the other TEs uh, we are in agreement with. This is consistent with the uh, PUD, and we would ask for your approval. Commissioners, comment, Nick? Protest? None. Move variance to TE2. Second. The motion is second to move the variance to TE2. Any discussion? Cast your votes. That's approved. Move the plat incorporating the uh, exhibit that's been distributed. Yeah, yeah. Is there a second? second. The motion is second to uh, approve item 10 
incorporating the two exhibits handed out showing sprinkling and uh, also the new uh, common areas as displayed on the exhibit. Cast your votes. And it's approved. Thank you. David, I've got something for you if you could come up here. What's that? Item 11, PUD 1539, to rezone 9016 South Shields Boulevard from AA and C3 to PUD Box 522 Concord Drive here on behalf of the applicant. This is a PUD that was continued from uh, the docket two weeks ago and we are now back. Um, we did have an opportunity to uh, visit with the neighbors about their concerns. Uh, we did visit with Mr. Allen uh, about his concerns and one of the items that we're, we're going to be able to do now and you'll see it in the uh, packet as you get it is the, the hatched line around the existing residential subdivision, we are uh, agreeable to put a restriction in place to where the first 125 feet uh, outside of that residential subdivision, we will have no multifamily and we will have a building restriction of single story. So we believe that that, that makes all the uses compatible. Um, we, we certainly believe that the one story uh, should, we hope it satisfies the concerns of the neighbors. Um, they could certainly have two-story structures, so we, we are more limited than, than they are. Uh, the rest of the uses we do believe are, uh, are appropriate now that we will not abut them with multifamily. If you look at the map that's on the screen now, you can see that the neighborhood is currently uh, directly abutted by multifamily. With our revisions, we have pushed any of the multifamily away from the single family. One of the issues that we discussed uh, extensively last time was signage. One of the handouts you received is a series of pictures of all the existing signage around us. Uh, we have a lot of industrial zoning, a lot of heavy commercial zoning that are not in PUDs, that are not in SPUDs, so you have a lot of signage. At the suggestion of, I believe it was Commissioner Gales last time, we came up with um, what we we now believe it's reasonable and agree to a, a, a height limitation of 15 feet. And if we think we need anything bigger, we have to come back at the specific plan stage and justify it. Uh, but the 15-foot sign would definitely put us, we think, in a reasonable position. It will put us in the smallest sign up and down Shields and up and down 89th. But it's also consistent with signage that this commission has uh, been approving uh, recently not only two weeks ago, but also further down south on, on Western. So with that and the curtailment of uses and, and pushing them away from the residential, we think we have an application that is reasonable. One other use unit that, that has been discussed is the uh, liquor store use unit, and uh, we are agreeable to deleting that from the entirety of the PUD. I'm happy to answer any questions. Question is before we hear from protesters. Oh, well, okay, signage, since this is the, uh, the exhibit that you showed. Just an editorial comment. These are poster childs for why the city should have sign ordinances that don't allow any of these kind of signs to be constructed ever again. Thank you, but this is, a, this is great evidence to present to whomever powers that be to revise our sign ordinance so we don't have to look at these kind of signs anymore. Thank you for presenting this. Sure. Uh, and, that, and that's why now we... The, so the second thing is I assume your 15 foot is a monument sign? Yes, sir. Okay. That's all. Hey, David, uh, on, yes, on one other thing. Um, I didn't hear you say anything about the little panhandle that goes, runs south on the east side. We agreed, or uh, I asked you to uh, make that nothing more than, than an assisted living or uh, that type of, of uh, 
facility in there, and I didn't hear you say anything about that. What we've got is the 125 foot wraps around this panhandle. That's not going to work with me. That's not what we agreed on. Uh, tell us again, David, what you, David? We're fine with taking multifamily from the panhandle. Okay. Okay. All right. We do have a number of people signed up to speak. David, if you'd take the, sure. that down off the easel. Uh, I'm going to call you up in the order that uh, the slips were handed to me. Uh, I'm going to ask you to share your thoughts, but also not repeat what someone before you has already said. Uh, we will register all of the comments. Uh, the first is Joanna Trimble. You can pull that down, please, so we can hear you and give us your name. You think so? My name is Joanna Trimble, Thank and you. I'm a 50-year 50 50-year 50 resident of the Brookside Edition, and um, I'm just terribly concerned about this fact that they're talking about maybe putting an industrial park or something right behind my house. I've had a golf course for 50 years, um, or apartments, or a hotel. I could live with I could live with the idea if they decided to build a church there and ballparks, but I just don't think this is the place to put big industrial things on a quiet area like that. There's ponds back there and I noticed on the paperwork they plan on leaving those ponds. But uh, I just think most of the neighbors are very unhappy with this, with this zoning. Uh, we're under the understanding that this property has not been sold yet. I don't know the answer to that. Okay, okay. Um, but I just would like to state that I'm totally against any kind of industrial things or bars back there. Most of the people in our area are older people, and. Um, We've never had any problems with burglary or anything until they built the apartments south of us. And, and since then, we've had several break-ins and things stolen. And so this is concern about whether they put other apartments or anything there. Well, I understand there will be no more, there'll be no apartments built here. No apartments, okay. Is that right, David? No apartments? Or am I misrepresenting that? Uh, if there were apartments, they'd have to be in north. Okay. There's no one in the panhandle and none within the first 125 feet. North. How far from 89? I mean on 89? Uh, there could be none in here and there could be none in the first 125 here so it would have to be somewhere up here closer to 89. Closer to 89? Yes ma'am. That's not, that's not enough distance really to, you know, to justify that. Um, I just don't know any more to say. I just, we're just very unhappy, you know, when you've lived somewhere and been very comfortable for most of your life, well, you just don't, um, you don't need big disruptions in it. I understand. I can, I can go along with if they put, you know, a church there and ball fields and stuff. I can go along with that, you know. But I just don't see having an industrial park or apartments or a hotel. Okay, thank you. But thank you. William Gifhorn. Hi, I'm Bill Gifhorn, 4607 Southwestern Oklahoma City. I oppose the zoning change on this property. Um, I've been talking to the neighbors a lot. Don't want apartments. We want a, some separation from the development as it is. It's a beautiful piece of property. I hope you all have gotten a chance to go out and look at it. A lot of nice trees. Uh, you changing it to the PUD 1539, I'm, I'm not familiar with any of the regulations on what each zoning number means, but as I understand it, they can put just about anything they want there. 
They haven't told us what they want to put there. They've got ideas. They put out uh, little maps on, well, we might put a church here and a baseball field here, or we might put some industrial here or a hotel here. They've got, it's all over the map. They haven't given us anything to really go, hey, we don't want this. So we pick out a few things that we really don't like. I don't think very many people want to live next to apartments anywhere. Uh, we've got a, part, a big apartment complex on the south border of our neighborhood. More apartments are going to be with, it just, it's overkill. We don't need that much in the same area. There's many things that can be developed on that piece of property. As I said, it's beautiful. Look into making a park. Places for people to go, walking, exercise. Uh, there's just lots of things that can be done to, you can build up the commercial part of it, but you can also save part of it as a beautiful, as a green area. We have no, nothing like that in that area. Everybody around the world or around the country is talking green. You know, it's nice to have a little spot that isn't, doesn't have something built up on it. It's not all paved and have a parking lot and people trying to sell stuff. So uh, I'm just concerned that there's too many options available to the buyer and we don't have any clue of what they're actually going to do. We need to get some specific uh, ideas of what they plan to do, where they plan to do it, and how they plan to do it before we even get involved in this. It's just you, you don't need to change it yet. There's just not enough information. I got a couple of maps uh, from Mr. Lance Gross, and I didn't meet him. One of the neighbors met him. And we've got option one and option two. And again, I'm just looking at it and reading all this. And do you, have you got the maps? Do you know what it means? Do, do you know what they mean? Help me. I'm. Uh, they're all for option one. Well, first we, of all, we can we can live with option one, but I don't I don't know. Nobody said anything that uh, this is. Uh, hey, take your pick and see if we can uh, settle it that way. You ask if we understand what it is. I believe we do. There are three separate tracts of land in this UD. The uses are set out in our staff report. Track three is the track that is adjacent to uh, most of the residential area. It's limited to the dozen or so uses listed on uh, page six of the staff report. Uh, thus, it requires a 125-foot setback plus another 125-foot away from the addition of single-family structures. Uh, so I believe we do understand it. So, so we we can vote on uh, option one or option two. Is that what you're saying? No. No, sir. What we're voting on is the uses that are set out in this PUD right. by the tracts. The developer has the right then to put those uses, or I guess with the deletion of the uh, alcohol beverage retail right. use Correct. that they've deleted, uh, the developer can then decide on, on which uses go in, in each of those tracks as long as they're a defined use. So and they've, uh, okay. they've eliminated the multifamily, the, sing, the uh, three and four family, the two family, the group residential, they've eliminated all those two? They've pared it down? Is that what they, you They've moved their apartments from a practical standpoint, the way I look at it, the only place they could build a, a traditional apartment structure would be up in the uh, far corner up on 89th Street, basically 
89th and I-35 would be the only place they could put apartments, practically speaking. Uh, with this 250-foot wraparound around the addition, What they're trying to offer you is a buffer of less intense uses around your area and then other commercial and office uses that's further a, out in the track. I think that's a start in the right direction, but uh, uh, we need to pinpoint a little bit uh, closer what, what they're actually going to do there before we start we, arguing one way or the other. They will have, have to play. bring another proposal back to us. The final, that we'll have to, we will have to look at something else before this goes forward as far as what's going to go in what track. Right. Okay. No, I, I so realize this is the first again. stage of all of this. Yeah. I realize that. There's a lot more to come. Uh, right. But, uh, well, could I ask a question? Do you I'm just nervous. Do you have a neighborhood association in your community and your, in the residence there? And the second question is, have these developers or the applicant come and had a meeting with the neighbors? Not that I know of. I, I, so I'm not aware of it. Of, uh, let's get together. This is what Mr. we're going to do. Mr. Box said that they already talked to the neighbors, but I, I wasn't aware of it. Okay. I, I would, uh, Mr. I believe his name's Mr. Ruff, and approached me, and I gave him my information. He said he would talk to me, and I never, I never heard from him. So. Uh, would love to talk, love a chance to talk to. We want to work it out. We know it's going to. We know it's going to sell. We know it's going to be developed. Let's work it out where everybody's happy. Uh, I, I just think there's just too many unknowns right now to to, to change to change this and, and where they can just pop off and go. Well, we've already changed it. We can do this and this and this. I know that still has to be approved, mm -hmm. but it's too early to change the zoning. We have too little information. Other people, Thank you. Need to. Thank you very much. We've got several other people that want to be heard. Paul Seitzinger. Again, some new information, please. Uh, Your so. name, please. My name is Paul Seitzinger, 409 Brookside Terrace. Thank you. Um, so all I did was I went and printed off the Oklahoma City Municipal Code and just read through the requirements for an application. So first, I'd like to submit that the application is not complete. Uh, there's a number of items in that it asks for, uh, PUD design statement, uh, table setting the minimum and maximum total dwelling units. I don't, I don't have that. I didn't see that anywhere. Uh, statement specifying the number, type, height, and display area of signs. I don't see anything like that. Now, it appears that they gave you something else that wasn't on the website, so that's not in there. Uh, description of sidewalks, pedestrian paths, and bikeways with the, de with the development. I don't see that anywhere. Statement describing the guarantee and assurance to be provided for the perpetual maintenance of common open space, drainage areas, recreation areas, sidewalks, parking, private streets, and other privately owned common facilities and serving the project. That's not in there. So that, that has to do with the design statement. Uh, if you look at the PUD master development plan, uh, it doesn't, uh, there's no topography map that uh, the, the code says they, they require. I didn't see that anywhere. Uh, and, and, you know, there's a list of things here. I can keep going. Uh, and finally, you know, the PUD has some goals and objectives. Uh, you know, one of them is minimize adverse effects upon surrounding property. Uh, this this doesn't do that. I mean, if you're if you're looking at the property, the the residential property value goes down immediately when uh, when they start putting in apartments or industrial complex. Um, contribute to the re revitalization or redevelopment of the area. It's a golf course and it's going to turn into an industrial park. As far as I know. Uh, so one of them said a hotel, is that? I said an industrial okay. use. Okay. So uh, I, I would argue that a hotel does not contribute to the revitalization of the area. Coming from a golf course to, to, a, to a, an apartment complex or a hotel or really much of anything, 
Now, like everybody has said, a church, uh, if the church was to come in and put a church in that area, you know, I, I'm all for that. I mean, a church, uh, there's a lot of public nine housing or section nine housing in the area, and, and a church that would uh, uh, help those people would be fantastic. Um, so, again, one, I would, I would dispute the application's completeness. Uh, I'd also dispute that the, uh, um, uh, it doesn't meet the goals and objectives of the PUD as defined by the Oklahoma City Municipal Code. And um, uh, I would also, so my mother's lived there for 50 years also, and uh, my dad, who doesn't live there, has told me that the, the golf course had agreed to some uh, commitments to the neighborhood. I'm currently in the process of searching for those covenants and uh, um, would like some additional time to find those covenants. Bottom line is I don't see how you can approve this application. It's not complete. It doesn't meet the goals of the PUD, and um, uh, it, it, it's just uh, it's just wrong to the community. Well, I'm going to ask the staff about uh, the completeness of the application because they're usually pretty thorough. Okay. Uh, and with respect to the covenants, uh, the, that would be a private contract. That would be something that neither the planning commission nor the city would have any role in. But it would be have to, it would it would move with the property, I think. Would what? It would it would uh, shift with the property, wouldn't it? I mean, if if the golf course has has a covenant with the neighborhood, then if the golf course sells, uh, I mean, you can't just say, oh, yeah, never mind those covenants that we put in place 50 years ago. Well, you would have to consult a lawyer about that. Yeah. It and, would depend and, on whether on the that. property. Yeah. The covenants were put in place when the property was all in single ownership. So I agree. You need to consult an attorney about that. Working on it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and then lastly, so you know, you said you're going to ask about the uh, completeness of the application. If you look at page 10 of 16 in the in the application, it shows Exhibit A, Exhibit B, Exhibit C, and Exhibit D. Can someone show me where those exhibits are? Because I haven't seen them. Okay. JJ? The report is a summary of the PUD. It's not the entire master development plan, mm -hmm. and as well as the exhibits. Uh, I'll be glad to share the entire PUD with you. Okay. It's about maybe half of what the entire PUD is. Okay. It's in the report. So then the community hasn't, you know, the neighborhood hasn't received the full PUD. Correct. Well, the neighborhood hasn't, nor have we specifically. So, uh, and that's not normally unless you ask for it. Okay, uh, we're asking for it. I think the whole neighborhood's asking for it, and um, I think that's it. Any question for me? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mitzi Smith. Something new we haven't heard before, Ms. Smith? Um, I just want to, I live at the house that abuts what I believe you're calling the panhandle, which according to the paperwork that I have, that's track one. And I'm just concerned as a wife and mother whose husband works long hours, I'm at home with my children alone, and the idea of some of these things that are listed on here is, I just believe it's a safety concern. Um, hotels, gas stations, just other things. I know we've we've got an assurance that there's not going to be apartments there now, but I'm still just concerned that I believe it's going to bring in a lot of possible burglaries, just safety issues for my family as we live in that area. So that's just my concern. I just wanted to place that before you. Thank well, you. If there was to be a hotel or a gas station, my guess is it would be uh, up north along 89th Street where there'd be access. It would not would not be internal to their site. So the likelihood of people It's wandering. still going to be fairly close to our backyards and where our kids are out. Did, did you hear the so. applicant mention uh, that they, that panhandle would be nothing more than an assisted living? That would be fine. Okay, that's, yes. that's what they have agreed to. Well, that would be fine. Thank okay. You. Charlotte Martin.
I'm Charlotte Martin. I live at 509 Brookside Terrace. And I don't know if you realize it or not, but this is a nine-hole golf course. It's not a huge golf course. And uh, my husband and I have actually tried to buy this golf course many times. And we've either been told the city of Moore bought it or it's not for sale. We don't get any response from anybody. And second place, since the, we had those apartments put in on the north, I mean on the south of us, excuse me, south of us, there has been an attempted kidnapping of one Zachary Cooey, and um, we've had at least, that I know of, three trailers stolen, burglaries, and um, also the people from those apartments come over in our two-street neighborhood, and they jog, and one of them assaulted my ex-daughter-in-law, slapped her right in the face. And the neighborhood is made up of mostly elderly, however, we're getting more and more children in there. And I know my husband and I, my husband would be 70, and I'm 66. <clears throat> I may be 67. I haven't figured it out. I'm kind of nervous. But at any rate, <clears throat> in um, 2000 or 2001, we adopted my two great nieces and great nephew to keep them out of the system and give them a good life. And uh, so as not to be a burden on the state, and we did a private adoption. We paid for everything. We paid for their health care even. And uh, we just want a safe place for them to live. And we were assured when that golf course went in that it would stay there. And I know things change, but we don't need those apartments there. It's just a little bitty area, 125 feet. I'm sure those apartments on the north are further than 125 feet, but we've had all these incidents already just since they were put in. And uh, we don't want it to change, like I said, we would be willing to buy it as a golf course. We have tried for years. We cannot even get anyone to respond to us other than to lie to us. And I understand from talking to Mr. Allen yesterday that you can recommend that they not put in certain things or that they leave it 125 feet, but they don't have to. They can say they will, but once it's said and done, they don't have to do that. And also I understand it is not sold. And see, for years we've been told it's either already sold or it's not for sale or just one really lie after another. And um, I don't know why they don't call us back, unless it's because my husband is a nephew of Duffy Martin who put that in. He's a shirt tail relative. We see him maybe once every couple of years at a Christmas party. Um, but we're not asking for help to buy it, you know. And uh, we just do not want anything but that golf course there. Thank you. Bill Groves. Again, Mr. Grove, something new, please? Well, I hope I'm getting something new. I'm one of the new guys in the neighborhood there. Uh, I've been there about 10 years, as you can tell. That's most new. of got, what we have yeah. is elderly there. Um, I've talked to Mr. Mark Ruffin a couple of times on the phone. Um, what I'd like some clarification on is uh, I would be in the Zone 3 track. Uh, uh, was that a, going to be a multi-story? going on back, or uh, is it a single story type structure? Zone track three, as I understand it, will have only single story uh, structures in it. Okay. Okay, we that's don't have any. That's the buffer area we're speaking of around the neighborhood. Okay, it's like uh, Mark and I discussed 150 feet, and uh, you know, I, I haven't, uh, talk to Mr. Box or anybody like that. Just, uh, just Ruffin is the only one I've been in contact with. David, it's 125 feet. Is that what you're proposing? Sir, in track three, uh, it's right here. 125 is approximately half, half of that track. Uh, so a single story up to that 125 foot mark. We've deleted multifamily from the uh, track entirely. From the entirety of track three. Right. So what's left is. You could have a duplex or single family. With without the ability to have anything above one story there, I mean you're not going to see a, a really higher intensity use. So there's no multi-story on on back from behind that? For the first 125. Then you could have it's like if you had a single family residential, they could build two story just like you guys. Okay. The gentleman on the corner there that, that has the apartments uh, behind him, we've measured that off. Uh, it is 150 feet from the privacy fence 
to the front step on the apartment. And it is, it is three-story, and he's staring, and they're staring right down in his backyard. That, that, but again, I'm not sure so, what that has to do with this. What, well, if we're going to have multi-story, I mean, we're going to have to get back farther than, than 150 but feet. The multi-story is limited to, to not a, there won't be multi-story apartments. Don't you have two-story houses in your addition? No, sir. No one has a second floor? There is one garage that I'm aware of that has a second floor on top, but I don't, re I don't so know of any other two-story. What two they're stories. saying is the first 125 feet will be single-story. The next 125 feet, out to 250 feet, could be a two-story dwelling on okay. an apartment house. Two-story would be, I think, would be okay. But that's, uh, yeah. Okay. That's what they're offering you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jesse Allen. Jesse Allen, 517 Brookside Terrace. Um, I'm really disturbed by the lack of clarity about this whole thing. And nobody seems to want to come forth and say what is really going to happen. Um, I knew nothing of a neighborhood meeting that was spoken of. Uh, I don't know anybody else in the neighborhood that I've talked with that knew anything about it. I would respectfully ask for a neighborhood meeting in the evening when many of the residents can't they can't be here during the daytime. I understand. And, and uh, I would ask for an evening meeting uh, in, that, in that area, hopefully. And that's my request today, so, so that we could talk more about what, what's going to happen. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. David? Just a, a couple points. I, I do believe with the uh, additional modifications we made here, um, we do have commercial type uses, but none of those are now abutting the residential. And when you look up and down Shields and 89th, you have nothing but straight zoning. Um, we will be the most restricted um, parcel of land in a several mile radius. So uh, we believe that this will be a great redevelopment of this site and hopefully some of the other industrial and straight commercial tracks, it'll likewise start to redevelop in a more appropriate manner. We'd ask for your approval. Discussion, commissioners? Mr. Chairman, if I would, uh, when I first looked at the application that was included in the packet, uh, I, I reflected back on what the commission has done since the time I joined the commission, and that would be when the PUD would come in, it would have a square box <clears throat> and then square boxes in the middle of it with every use that the underlying zoning would allow. That was a PUD. Well, the evolution of that PUD has come to the point where we have requested a significant amount of information in the PUD, where things are located, how they're going to relate to the surrounding neighborhoods, uses, etc. <coughs> Pardon me. And then We've imposed a, a specific plan to prove what it is that they came in with the application, all of which prevented exactly what we're hearing today from the neighbors who don't know anything, nor do I. What I see in my packet, uh, as far as the outline of the commercial portion of this, is significantly different than what I see has been presented here. And without anybody contacting the neighbors to have a meeting, you guys will be affected by this. You, know, you will be. I don't oppose this being a church property, as you don't. I don't oppose this being a commercial property. It's, it's, it's ripe for that kind of development. What I don't see is any respect for the residents of these of Brookside Country Club Edition being informed and consulted with what it is is going to be proposed. This is one of these that goes backwards, in my opinion, from what the Commission has adopted as policies. It's kind of like a speculative thing. We may do a church, we may do commercial, and we're going to have all these uses, track one, two, three, 
where things are going to be. Well, maybe something is in the northwest corner. I don't know. I would respect, I mean, request that there be a continuance of this, given time so that the neighbors aren't totally in the dark, and so that I'm not totally in the dark with where these things are going to be. I just think, and I told uh, uh, the applicant and, and David, is that this is just a computer printout of an idea. You know, just, you need to push a button, you had boxes drawn, and, and we want all these uses in this. And then the site plan, the specific plan, well, I mean, it may come in and doesn't resemble this one bit. It may, you know, it, so I think that it's a mistake to go into an approval process with this particular application without input from the neighbors, without really thinking about what it is this commercial development would be and how it's going to look and how, how it relates to one to another with screening, with setbacks, with landscaping, uh, pedestrian, I mean, it, however this works, there needs to be more work on it. I would request that this not, well, I can't approve it like it is if it goes for an up or down vote, but I'm certainly not opposed to it being a commercial property. I'm opposed to having people left in the dark about what it is that's going to happen to my property. And you come in with a meeting here, and they've changed it. Oh, it's a 125-foot setback. We're OK. The map that I see in my packet shows a massive amount of apartment buildings right next door. You know, I think it's, you know, Come in and let us look at something that has more substance to what it is that can be proposed with this commercial development. That's my Jim. I don't. Um, <coughs> the next phase, David, if you'll come back up here, the next phase that we would see would be specific, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Th that's correct. Okay. And before that phase would be adopted, before it even comes to this commission the next time, will you be willing to go out and talk to each one or a group and let them help determine what goes in that? And when you bring it back to us, show us exactly where it's going to be, what's going to be there, and so on and so forth. Yes, it will, not only will we do it before the specific plan, we'll. Mr. Ruffin tried to reach out to all the folks that were here last time. There's some folks here that, that weren't here last time, but between now and council, we'll go have that big group meeting. Um, so yes, we okay. will do that. And uh, a couple of other things. Um, in our discussion, uh, you agreed also where the, the uh, well, the south side and the west side of that panhandle would be not a um, stockade fence, it would be a masonry type fence that would separate those, did I not? Uh, I think what we agreed to were, were brick columns. Brick columns mm -hmm. plus, and no boards in between those brick columns. We, uh, and I, I talked to JJ just this afternoon, right after the lunch, to try to get something done with that stockade fence on the apartments to the south. It's, they're, they're in terrible shape. But, and he's got that, he'll maybe get somebody out there to look at that. But it's my understanding that you agree that it would be masonry? Yeah, I just talked to Mr. Ruffin. We agree to, to masonry or, or like kind, it won't be the wood. Probably. Okay, no wood at all. Okay. No wood. Um, and uh, the setback, the uh, uh, nothing other than a assisted living as such in the, the panhandle shape there. Well, it, we deleted the multifamily, but we, we have, like, you know, child care or, like, you and I talked about, an office. Um, but no multifamily. It would be something like assisted living or you could have a single family. A very low, low type yes, density sir. type thing. Yes, okay. Um, and if this thing moves today, what, what, what time are you talking about for, before this would actually come back to us? It would be, you know, uh, quite some time. I mean, four or five months. months. I mean, six it will be six weeks till we go to council, and then, you know, we'd, we'd gear up and 
you know, I, I can't predict the exact timeline. It'll probably be a little while, but we'll go meet with the neighbors next week as we march on to council. Okay. Well, and, uh, from what I'm hearing from the neighbors, they don't want to really say, well, you know, they, they want specifics, uh, and I believe that's what Mr. Bright's saying. That's what I want to see. But I know that in the next phase, we, we should see that. That is correct. Okay. And you will ass uh, make, assure us that you will get with the neighborhood and let them help in determining what that would be. Yeah, we will sit down with the neighbors as many times as they'd like. Okay, Nick and then Janice. And me too. Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm confused, somewhat frustrated by some of the comments today. If you'll recall the last meeting, we looked at this application and we looked at the tracks and we looked at the proposed uses and I thought there was pretty much agreement that the uses were appropriate in each of the tracks. And today we took out retail sales of alcohol. But, uh, the neighbors last time requested a buffer. They provided the buffer. They asked that part R4 not be up next to them. They've done that. We talked a great deal last time about specific plans, and even on TE5, if you'll recall, that talked about signage. Right. That we, my recommendation was we, that we keep TE5, and if they wanted more signage than a 15-foot monument sign, they they come in and, and make a case for it. And yeah. frankly, had Mr. Ruffin accepted that, I believe last week we would have approved this. Now, today we're saying all of a sudden we're looking at a large speculative PUD. We have a couple more neighbors here basically expressing the same concerns from before. A couple saying we just want to play a golf course. Well, I don't think staying a golf course is realistic. Uh, but now we're going backwards. And I, I don't know what, what signal we're, we're, we're sending here. Uh, either the uses are appropriate or they're not. If they're not, we need to, to get the inappropriate uses out. Uh, I am somewhat disappointed that with the amount of protest we had last week that there wasn't more communication with the neighbors. But as the one gentleman said, I guess there is not an organized homeowners association. Apparently, in specific individuals were contacted. Uh, I'm somewhat frustrated by all this. I'm sorry, Janice, you didn't want to say it then? Yeah, Mike? Okay, okay, Mike. Well, if I may, just to further to Commissioner Gale's point, is that as I look at track one, these are, it's, excuse the, the commercial track. It's, this is in an area that is appropriate for commercial zoning, that all the uses that we would see that are set out for track one, we would approve in a minute. It's between I-35 and Southeast 89, two major, an interstate highway and a huge major arterial, South Shields, uh, again, being an arterial. So I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't have a problem with track one. Now we move down to the commercial and the apartment track. It seems to me that as a res in, in the residential that we have appropriately separated the apartments to 250. Would that be fair, mm -hmm. basically? This is 660 feet right here. So you're looking at over 200 feet before you see. Where the apart from, from the apartments. Um, and, and look. I can't speak to the apartments to the south. I know the apartments that are getting built these days are nicer and newer and better than the ones that are there. I, I get that, but all of those uses are appropriate in this tract of land. And, and, and the uses that are limited with respect to tracks two and one, I, I feel like are appropriate. And, and, and I don't know what we'd do if we, if, if, it, if we send it back anywhere. I mean, it, look, it, it's, I, I get that it's speculative, 
That's why we have real estate developers, because they go develop. They find, they find uses, but we're, we're to look at the uses, and I don't have a problem with the uses that are set out with respect to these particular tracks, and more importantly than the, the, the uses as to how they're restricted with respect to height, setbacks, et cetera. So uh, I'm ready to move it along, personally. I don't, I, don't, I don't think we're going to get any further agreement between the developer and the neighbors, frankly. So I, I'm, I'm kind of ready to move it along. Janice, any thoughts before we move? Well, I mean, in any case where there is this much interest from adjoining residential uses, I think more communication is better than less communication. I was not here the last time. I can't speak to what the discussion was or what the uh, developer was charged with going to do. Um, this many houses, you can go stick something in the mailbox of each and every one of them if you want to have a meeting and talk to them. It's not that hard to get a hold of people. Um, I, I would really like to see uh, there be more communication between the developer and the neighborhood before we hear this case again, which is what I think we ought to do. And I think that I, I would like to have a little more settled feeling about the details uh, of uh, the application before I vote on it. Anyone else? I'm, I'm hearing two no votes, and we're six. Well, seven. no, we're seven. Excuse seven. me. We're seven. seven. I, uh, I'm okay with this, with the, uh, and I've talked to, I've talked to at least four and had email conversation with uh, a couple of residents, um, and I, I tried to sit down with the attorney and and the client and. Uh, they negotiated the, the separation. Uh, they ne negotiated the panhandle, uh, and they've negotiated the fence. If to move this forward, I'm going to um, make a motion that we approve uh, the application. And before I do that, I, I need one more thing from JJ. Um, JJ, is this application according to what it should be? The man that came up here before? Yes. Okay. Now, it's my understanding that the next application or the next phase will have that detail in in it. Is that correct? The specific that plan? he's talked. Yes. Yes. Okay. Back with exactly. So that what we won't be leaving doing. anything out of a. Uh, we're appropriate with what we've gotten in front of us. And everything that comes back will be specific. Okay. And uh, with the um, attorneys willing to sit down with the, the, the people to uh, help design this uh, piece of property somewhat, you know, and I'm sure that, uh, that still a lot of them would still like for it to be a golf course. I hate to lose a golf course. Uh, you know, I but, um, you know, I, I, I think we're to the point here that we, we, we just need to move forward. <clears throat> and uh, I will be more than happy to participate in any of those. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I, I think that the, from what I've heard from the attorney and from the client, that they'll be willing to work with us on the next phase. So with that, uh, I'll make a motion to approve with the adjustments that we've made and set forth. Second. Uh, David, what about the, t the technical evaluations? You didn't speak to those. T1 and 2 we're good with. 3 we can delete because I think we've handled it through our buffer we discussed. 4 we're fine with. And 5 rather than 8 to 15, and we're fine. And then 
the signs and the EMDs, right? No, no, EM, no EMDs, right? Yes, sir. Okay. I did a comment before we vote, and that is I think the application is appropriate for the area. The golf course is not going to stay clearly. Uh, we're not going to get more single-family residential being developed in there. They're getting a buffer. Uh, they're getting some of the other things that they've asked for. Areas do change over time. Uh, the only thing I would add uh, to what particularly Commissioner Allen has said is I wish there had been more or a better means of communication with the neighbors so maybe they had a, a greater level of comfort before today. And with that, are we ready to vote? Well, may, I'd like to make a comment as well. My vote does not reflect any disagreement with Commissioner Hensley or Commissioner Yokel, Commissioner Gales, or Commissioner Allen. My sole request would be a continuance for two weeks to consult with the neighbors, and I think that that's fair. So my vote doesn't reflect at all that I think this should be a golf course. It absolutely is commercially developed. But that's the reason for my vote. I just think that this needs to be a continuance for a little while. Okay. We have a motion in the set. Do you want to say something, Jimmy? Well, Bob, uh, he's, <clears throat> he has agreed to sit down between now and the council. Okay. But, but, but I'm, okay. I'm and then we are going to see what you want to see and what I want to right. see right. At, at the next phase. And before we see it, he's going to sit down with the residents to help plan that. But, okay. but, but, and I agree totally. I mean, really, my vote doesn't reflect any disagreement with any of this. I understand. But, but, the, but just in, you know, with the neighbors who are saying, what's going on, I hope that meeting happens. I hope we see what we want to see. But just, I was just looking for a couple of weeks to say, you know, wait a minute. Take a deep breath and let's, but so that's, again, I don't disagree with any of this, you know, except the, except the vote. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Cast your votes. And it is approved. Thank you. Item 12 was continued. Item 13, ABC 808 for ABC 1 overlay of PUD 707 District, located at 801 Northwest 122nd Street. Randy Malone, 209 Southwest 89th Street F in Oklahoma City. As far as the last, I believe hole number three on the last agenda should, item agenda should be preserved because that is the site of the only eagle I've ever had in my life. Um, they, we're, we're back again, and last time, Commissioner Bright, you expressed concern about the uh, any additional uses that that might come about. And Could I, you stay stay with the mic? Oh, so I'm sorry, it, it's recorded. Thank you. you. You expressed concern about any additional uses that might come about if you approve this ABC. To that, I'd say, I, and mainly, I think you mentioned a concert, music, something like that that might disturb the neighbors. To that, I'd say I think the city will require additional permits, and that could be dealt with in that. But I'll, I'll move on. We feel like we're in the same position as any golf course in the city, the Bricktown Ballport, that, that sort of thing, and certainly less controversial than other ABCs that have been approved by the, by the council and the commission. So with that, we'll just leave it at that. Commissioner Cooper? Uh, yes. I, um, I needed to ask... Um, the committee, uh, other commissioners. Um, I think we've had several other similar kinds of ballparks. I think Nick, in, maybe in your area, maybe in Portland, um, soccer fields or something. Uh, and uh, really, I, I think the, 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 the question is, how are we going to be able to restrict how the beverages will be sold and distributed on the property. Can you speak a little bit to that with me being new to the council? Hi, Ken. My name is Todd Curry, um, 1203 Huntington Avenue, Oklahoma City. Uh, we are, the area encompass, that's encompassed on the map right here is our concession stand and then walkways leading to 
the um, stands at each of the different ball, the different fields. We do adult, adult softball and adult kickball uh, at the park, and so it's restricted to where people are going to be. Um, the entire property is fenced in. It wouldn't be, you know, um, there's no reason for people to be standing out behind the outfield of these particular fields um, or outside of the areas that are zoned in or that are, that are marked in on this. Other discussion, commissioners? No one has signed up. Mr. Chairman, in, there was two statements made um, a minute ago, reference made to the uh, Bricktown Ballpark. We did a ABC overlay on the entire ballpark, if you'll recall. Uh, and the reason we did that was not so you could sell alcohol in the right field, but the applicant made us aware that the ballpark may be used for special events like a concert where they could sell alcohol out on the ball field if they were having a concert or something like that. So that's a, that's a special deal. Um, Lee, your reference to the soccer field, we did allow beer in the indoor soccer place uh, after a certain hour when only adults are there. My problem with this particular application has always been, not that they're selling beer, I, I, I don't, don't mind that, but we're selling it and we're spreading it over 137,000 square feet. Uh, that to me is too much area, too much time, and what we also have to think about is who's using these fields. We're going to have some high testosterone competitive softball teams out there, and I've, I've been there done that. Uh, Sometimes things get a little little short. When they get a little short and there's been a lot of drinking, the ball bats can fly. I, I just think it's, I think the area is too large. Uh, I'm not saying that it won't work if it's smaller, but but I, 137,000 feet seems large to me. How would you restrict the area? How, I mean, I agree with Commissioner Gales is that this is a broad brush huge amount of area that is there a plan that you could perhaps confine the service to you know you have that I think I recall that one common area that's down to the south portion that people bring picnic baskets and their beer cases or whatever they do I, I don't know but just in that area rather than the whole thing well I guess part of it may be my ignorance is you know, I've restricted everywhere somebody could be drinking a beer. I'm not necessarily going to be selling beer at the far dugout on the far west field. But, you know, if, if we've got teams playing there, which we will, and they want to drink beer, they're going to walk to the concession stand, they're going to buy beer, they're going to walk back over there, and they're going to drink it while they're sitting there watching that here's, game. Here's my question. Is the ABC overlay, does that restrict where a person can carry a can of beer? Or is fair, it, I'm fair, talking about where you can sell the beer. Yeah, that's my question. I'm, in my I, area. I was under the impression it needed to cover everywhere somebody could be standing drinking. I don't know. I believe it. I believe yeah. the term is, and Susan, correct me, but it's sale and consumption. Yes, that would include. They would be able to drink it wherever it, it was. Cover all the areas where it's sold and consumed with an ABC right. overlay. Exactly. And I, I think the problem we're running into is that, I, you know, from where our concession stand is located, to get to those far west fields or east fields, there's a pretty fair distance that they've got to walk just due to the size of the field themselves. And that's what's created this large area. I mean, I've, if I was going to, I could mark where people will be sitting and drinking, and it's going to be in the stands around each one of these parks and then in and around the concession stand. It would be a lot smaller area, but, but then, then, then somebody can assign no alcoholic beverages beyond this point. Does well, that work? Well, obviously well, that won't work. It has, has something has to be enforceable. Uh, well, they <laughs> buy your beer, Bob. 
hold it, don't spill it, walk over there and take a sip. Uh, come on. I'm just trying, because I, mean, I, think, I think I really reflect upon what Commissioner Hensley reflected upon last time we heard this, is that, come on, beer at ballparks, you know, beer at golf courses, you know, it's just, I mean, I, and I, I can't see that, that other than there's, you know, highly, you know, motivated softball players to prove that they're better than the other guy, uh, I, I just reflect upon what Commissioner Hensley said is that what difference what difference have we got here than we do at a golf course? Yeah. You know, they've got golf clubs and start swinging uh, golf clubs. I think I think the <laughs> difference know? is uh, I think the difference is the concentration of people. There there are not, you know, as many people on a golf course as there are at one of these events. I think the level of um, uh, antagonism that, that may be present point. would be a factor, perhaps. Now, I do think there are differences, but whether they're relevant to the decision that we're making here today, I guess, is something else. What, okay, for the purpose of, for, just to get on with this, what about that one portion, that large portion south, you know, where you have the park? Yeah. That, that whatever that is, that's where you consume beer. That's an option, but you know, in these, you know, recreational co-ed kickball games, you know, the the people that want to watch them, want to, you know, that are going to buy the beer, want to sit and watch these games, or, or even, you know, be, sit in the dugout and have Susan, beer. Susan, whose responsibility is it to monitor the consumption part of an ABC? The operator, operator. huh? The operator. It would be the operator. If there was a complaint, I guess they could. It would be a zoning. So that would be the risk decision. that you would take if you if you confined it to just that park area, that you've got responsibility to restrict the consumption elsewhere. Yeah, and I, I think that I mean that's going to be challenging. And then also, <laughs> you know, it, it, people aren't going to want to aren't going to go to the park just to drink beer. I mean, there's plenty of bars and restaurants in this town to drink beer. So what they're going there is to watch to drink beer while they're watching somebody play softball or kickball, and so. You know, I, look, I, I'm not. Again, it's the concern. It's it, it, not this use and not this application or this tract of land. It's the ability. It's as Janice brings to our attention every time we have an ABC, and I agree with her fully that the law is incomprehensible in that you agree that as long as you're operating this thing that it ought to that that's it should run as long as, if it quits being used by this particular use you got to come back in and apply for a new ABC unfortunately we don't have that particular opportunity so we have to look at it for this particular use and this particular application and I think that you know softball games last about an hour and 15 minutes I mean it's it's lo it's three two beer. It's low point beer, not wine, mixed drinks, etc. Um, I got a hard time getting too excited about this. I I think that our change ought to be the law, but this application, I think we need to move it along. Personally, I'd I'd, I'd move approval. <laughs> oh. You're going to vote? <laughs> Stand there and vote? All right. Cast your votes. And it's four to three, and there are seven of us. Pardon me? Yes? We're continued to the next meeting. It takes five votes for approval or denial of the Planning Commission action. Okay. okay. Thank you. Item 14 is PUD 1543 to rezone 2001 East Britain Road from AA and C3 to PUD 
My name is Greg Massey with Red Plains, representing the owner on this application. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to give you a little background on on what's going on or what brought this before you. The uh, the parcel, as you can see on the south side, is currently zoned C3. <coughs> uh, the owner operates that as uh, a decorative pool and waterscape design um, and construction site. He is also selling. Um, pool supplies and chemicals and so forth for the maintenance of those things. He is wanting to expand his operation and build one more warehouse for the storage of additional construction equipment and construction materials. Um, he was previously issued building permits, I believe in 2006 and again in 2009 to expand this operation. A recent application, he was told, that is not an allowable use in C3. And it was recommended by staff to, uh, to come back before you guys with the PUD. So that's why we're here. And based on the uses that he has currently and what he's proposing, um, the I-1 light industrial was the appropriate use uh, or zoning for that use. Um, the exhibits that I proposed do identify the expansion. Would show up on this exhibit I've got up here a little bit better, um, out outlined in pink. Uh, again, it's uh, essentially for the storage of materials. He is also now uh, doing the outdoor kitchens, and he's selling, um, obviously, materials to help construct those as well uh, and doing the construction and design himself. Um, I have reviewed the TEs uh, with the owner and have no objection to anything that's been brought uh, to our attention by staff. Uh, there was one question with respect to TE number five for clarification on sidewalks. Uh, and I know sidewalks is a big issue with the city as to the timing as to when that would be required for construction. Um, obviously, you know, the facility he's looking at adding uh, is not extensively large. Um, he's got over 1,200 foot of frontage of both, uh, along both streets, Eastern and Britain. And he would certainly ask that with the building permit application on the single building on the east end, he not be required to spend you know, twice as much to add um, over a quarter of a mile of sidewalks um, for that additional uh, 4,000 square foot warehouse. Okay, the sidewalk will be required with each building permit. So whatever you submit for your building permit for your development area, that You'll have to put the sidewalk in for that piece. Well, and, and, and I understand that. And Excuse again, me, JJ, I, I'm, I didn't hear you comment. I'm sorry. Can you? Sidewalk is required at the time of the building permit. So whenever, whatever he submits in the way of a building permit on that site plan, the sidewalk will have to be built for that piece. Okay. Would that be restricted to that eastern piece? I mean, obviously, he owns the 10 acres. If there you only no submit the eastern piece as a building permit, yes. If you submit the entire 10 acres, then... Would he be required a lot split to do that? Because typically a, build, a legal description for the tract has to be submitted with the permit application. Yes. A lot split would be required to build on... I have a more fundamental point with respect to this sidewalk issue, right? and the use because i read the first line of the application and it said that we want to expand our existing construction company then i go and i see the additional c3 uses that are being asked for with respect to this including eating establishments not that i think they're inappropriate in this particular area but it's a bit it's, it's one thing to ask for 
I need to build a new warehouse. It's another thing to say, oh, and by the way, I need to build a Sonic or a 7-Eleven or, or all these other existing uses. And then, due respect to your point, Greg, and the next part of the comment is I don't want to build sidewalks. You want to be a commercial developer without doing the commercial development stuff, it seems to me. So I, 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 can't, I can't go, I can't give you one, I can't agree to approve one without approving the balance. And, and Greg, I was going to come at that a little different mm -hmm. direction, but I was going to ask you, where's the gas station going to be? There are none. Well, it says, it says it's an allowed use. Uh, uh, TE you know, numbers. Just like the, the truck stop, now it's been taken out in TE 5 or 6, whatever. Right. But you've got a, a plethora of, of uses, and you just said, and our, and our application says, the purpose is to expand the existing construction company. That is correct. Well, how can the existing construction company expand and say it's an adult daycare? Hmm. Maybe he's taking care of a adult fish for to put in ponds. Uh, <laughs> I, it, what Mr. Emsley brought up, I, I think, is, is to the point. Do we want to expand this site for our construction business, or do we want to develop it as a commercial right. corner? Right. Frankly, I, I'm with him. I don't think any of those uses necessarily are inappropriate for that area hmm. but it but we need to go one way or the other we either need to expand the construction company or we need or we need to be commercial if we're just expanding the construction company I'm with Commissioner Hensley I can probably have some leeway on the sidewalks if we're building a commercial center well we need some sidewalks I, I agree so where are we <laughs> well Let's keep in mind the property is currently zoned C3 on that southern half. So all the C3 uses that are currently allowed by code, he has he can build by right. That's not his intent, and that's part of the reason. All of these items that you've just gone through that it's listed as a plethora, those items were included by staff. We had no objection to them. There were items that they specifically requested to take out. We had no objection to taking those out. My original question to staff was would it be easier to come back and do a straight rezoning for I-1 and take out all the C-3 uses? Well, again, I, I think the answer to that is what you just said. Whatever the intent of your client is, should be addressed in this PUD, and and I'm seeing a conflict, and that's why I, why I raised the issue and trying to clarify it. Uh, you know, are are we trying to come up with a commercial development, or are we trying to expand our industrial use and our construction company? Uh, and both of which I think are probably appropriate for for this site, right? Uh, right. But to get this PUD to where we can get our hands around it. Uh, I think we need a, a little additional guidance. Uh, I think, you know, look, the, this is near the area where the Kim Ray yes. site is going in. Uh, I, look, I, frankly, I think it's an opportunity for your client, but he, he, I think he's kind of got some choices to make. But I, we had, there's a couple of things. One, we would we'd certainly want all the additional construction here to reflect the character that we've looked at uh, as far as construction materials, et cetera, for, for Kim Ray. Um, and I'm not saying that your client should limit his use to, frankly, I think it's an appropriate spot for a commercial corner. It's underserved, potentially, out there. But that's just my view. Um, but I, I think it, this kind of struck me as a little bit betwixt and between. Well, and if we're going to look at it as a commercial corner, we would normally want some sort of a conceptual idea of what that corner is going to look like, how it's going to come together, how traffic is going to flow, 
how pedestrian uh, paths will occur, uh, parking lot layouts, all those kinds of things. And that's not coming with this. So uh, we understand. You can't begin to put up a bunch of metal buildings and quote unquote, as I see just on the schematic here, and then all of a sudden get over somewhere further to the east and say, oh, well, we want the rest of this to be a commercial corner, and now we're going to do it. It's going to be entirely different for the rest of it. Uh, it there would just be a disconnect uh, even looking at how it's put together. Mm -hmm. Well, oh, and, and again, one of the requirements of the PUD is that a specific plan be brought back before you, and, and that's the purpose. I, I think what what Antonio is trying to avoid is three years down the road, you know, things change. Um, he's currently got a piece of property zoned C3. If he rezones and takes all the C3 zoning out and limits this specific application to an I-1 industrial um, landscape pool construction company, um, he's devalued that property. Um, he, he has no opportunity to do anything else with it unless he comes back and rezones again. Um, so, any that's, any of the uses that are that that's are sort of that's sort of the point, isn't it? Well, any of the uses that are currently objectionable, we have no problem taking out. Yeah, I, I, he's I, he's currently got a C3 zone tract of land that's worth more than it's going to be worth following this PUD if we take all of those uses out. Well, is it the right place to expand the, the pool and construction business? Is it, or, or is it the right place to uh, do a, a commercial thing and maybe you want the pool business somewhere else because that land's so valuable for C3? Let's I Can't that. you do it the other way? Wouldn't you want to just keep the commercial and add in your, can't you add your additional yeah. I, industrial use to build your building? I mean, you know, it's not my job to read design. I'm not trying to be the mm -hmm. deal. But I'll, I'll just say that if, if this was my land, I already had an industrial use on it, I would get as much C3 in it as I could in my PUD, and I would add, I'd have a C3 PUD, and I would add the industrial uses I needed, and I'd call it good. Exactly. And And that's... What you might want to... You may, that may not be what you want to do, but look. That seems to maximize, in my mind, that maximizes the use of the land in its highest and best use. Now, staff's probably going to disagree with me. No. I think the problem may be that um, he doesn't know what he wants to be when he grows up. I mean, you know, it's, he's not ready to design a commercial development. Um, that may be the best use of the land and bring its highest value and so on, but he's got a business there now that he wants to expand. And I, I think it's unfortunate for him, perhaps, that he's just at a place where he needs to decide which it is. Um, because I don't think that he can get um, approval, and maybe you're wrong about this, for a C3 development that's just, you know, called a PUD, but is nothing more than C3 zoning for this entire tract of land. And it doesn't sound to me like he's in a position to do much more than that. He's not um, where he needs to be to actually design uh, a, a PUD with a C3 base. Well, I guess my question is, this is an I-1 PUD with a bunch of C3 uses in it. And my question is, why can't it be a C3 PUD with some I-1 uses in it? My answer is that I think he's not ready to design a C3 PUD. Is there a design here? Well. What's the difference between this application and one that would be C3? I think the difference is that what he's told us he wants to do with it is to expand his existing business. Well, and I think he's just going to have to decide which of those well, things he and wants to do. And that was the point of my whole question. What is the intent here? But again, if the intent is to maximization for the future, I think that you want more C3 and less industrial. Well, I think as a land use, do we want industrial here? 
the city. With respect to this particular hard corner out at Britain, excuse well, me, Britain, at Britain. Well, considering what else is about to be built there. Yeah. Get the argument over sidewalks? No. No. <laughs> no. I mean, no. The only thing I would say about sidewalks there is that I own a construction argument. company. I'd want to be the nicest sidewalks yeah. in town. Uh, sidewalks were never the argument. It was a matter of clarification on timing as to when they would be required. And, and if I might address Mr. Gale's um, concerns on the C3, uh, I'm in complete agreement. And our original option that we looked at when the application for building permit was made and we were notified that's not an applicable use in C3, was can we go to the Board of Adjustment? I understand, and I, I don't think that's the route. I think this is the best route. I don't have a problem with your C3 uses. I don't have a problem with your I-1 BUD. I'm, I'm not saying that. I, I'm, I'm just saying there was some inconsistency here and was trying to clarify the intent. Commissioners, what's your pleasure? No one has signed up. Go for it. What did, did you say anything about the technical evaluations? Uh, yes, we are in agreement with the TEs. I'll move approval. Second. Second. Yes, your votes. Nothing happened. System died. That's happened the last couple of meetings, actually. Uh, yeah, but, but I don't know what it is. So we'll take a voice vote. All in favor, signify with aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. It's OK. It is approved. Thank you very much. Item 15, PUD 1544 to rezone 13100 Northwestern Avenue from PUD 380 to PUD 1544. There was something under that over there, and I don't know what it is or what to. Mr. Chairman, members, Commission Brian, can you help me wait a little bit? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Brian Coon with you as always representing the applicant. The applicant's with me today. Uh, if, they have any, if you have any questions for them, we'll be glad to bring them up. Um, what we have here is a PUD. It's out on Northwestern, uh, Northwestern Avenue. If uh, you know the area very well, there's a new St. Anthony's Hospital going on at the uh, southwest corner of um, Western and the Kilpatrick Turnpike. Um, what we're trying to accomplish here is two medical office buildings. Uh, so we're bringing you a new PUD. Currently, it's a PUD, a uh, very blank PUD that was done 20 years ago uh, with all the C3 uses. We are asking for O2 uh, with a few additional uses just for the medical building. Um, just a little history of what's going on on this corner. Um, probably six to eight months ago, uh, our client who owns the, owns the property to the north called, and there was a user that was looking for the hard corner up to the north of this site. So we've done some layouts on it. Then uh, this project came along, so we've done layouts on it. Uh, after we did this layout, about uh, two months ago, I guess, a month and a half ago, when the Chisholm Creek uh, PUD was approved, we learned about the road and everything that was going in on over there. Um, we are under contract to buy this much land at this point. There's a potential buyer for the land to the north. We know all about the road to the west, and that someday it may go on through, but not with this project. Um, because our north property line would be where there, where that right-of-way line is of the future road. Um, this, again, uh, two medical office buildings, three-story. I know the PUD document says four-story. Uh, maximum, we are willing to amend that at this time to three-story. At the time we wrote, the, wrote we're writing the, the documents, uh, we hadn't had started coming up with building elevations. We've started to do that now. Um, so we're getting, we're kind of narrowing, or not narrowing, but we're refining the process. Um, I've heard the word site-specific plan several times today. We will be back before you. We feel like we've got a pretty specific plan now of what the buildings are going to look like with our architectural standards, with our site plan, but we will be back before you every time we come back with, one, with the first building, the second building. Um, 
So uh, one, of the th one of the uses we're asking for within this is also a restaurant, but it will be totally contained within one of the buildings. So it could be a deli for patients or for the doctors. So that's why that use is in there. Um, on the TEs, I talked to um, uh, Blaine Sheffield yesterday in the engineering department on TE number three. The detention pond was built for this entire property many years ago, probably over 10 years ago. Um, I talked with Blaine. He has seen the plans. We actually sent them to him about two months ago because the owners to the east of this property want to know if there's any, any uh, credit they could get out of our detention pond, and there wasn't, but they reviewed the plans and they said the detention's taken care of. So I have a memo from him from yesterday says, that said the detention's not required. Now today, I was told that JJ, or actually uh, Curtis. Curtis, said let's keep that in there till we prove what we need to do. We're going to be back before you uh, with site plan, with site specific plans. So we'll, I think what the issue was that pond was built when nothing was platted out there. It's still built, it's still functioning, but there wasn't an easement created with it. So I think what he was wanting to see is us create a common area or an easement around the pond, and we can do that. And I'll work that out with Curtis uh, before we get to council. But because I'm sure that detention, again, Blaine, who works with the deer, has said, yes, detention's already provided. I just don't want to get it into the document that you've got to do detention when detention's already approved or already accepted. So I'll do however they want to work that out. Uh, I just want to be cautious not to put some words into the document that we have to live by when detention's already required or already provided. One of the things, and what, why he did that, was so he could market his property as its property that already has the detention ponds built. So like I said, the detention ponds have been there a long time. So I had requested that TE number three was deleted. Uh, Blaine said, yes, let's delete it. As of yesterday, it was okay, but today it's not. So I'll do whatever you all want to do on that. Uh, TE one and two we're fine with. TE four, uh, we're fine with that. Uh, TE five, I talked to Lance yesterday. This has to do with directional signs in the interior of the property. Uh, we have a, our signage out on the western, an eight-foot monument sign. Um, as, and you will also see that sign when I come back with my site-specific plans. But I want to be able to come back with the site-specific plan also and show you where our signage is. So I didn't want to get rid of that comment in the PUD because I do want to have interior signage. They'll all be monument. Uh, but there's going to be different doctors in different buildings. There may be an MRI facility down here where these people need to know they need to drive down here or whatever. So yesterday uh, Lance said that was fine, that they could delete five. Uh, six specific plan will be required, and yes, I agree with that, so you will see more detail. And as you see by the drawings I've shown, we're already developing that detail as we speak. So things are changing daily uh, on more and more and more information. Um, this number seven, the access, it was interesting in the staff report, in the body of the staff report, it said the access drive should, be, should line up with Pawnee Drive, and then the TE came back with the access drive must line up with Pawnee Drive. But I talked to Stuart Chai yesterday. He understood that we don't even own the land where that road is. I think that originally started, there was another staff report, another map that came out early when the staff report first came out, and they had PUD 321 to the west shown on the drawing, which showed Pawnee Drive a lot further south. It was the wrong PUD. Obviously, it's now 1,500 and something. And they had, our track, they had the church track plotted wrong. So the staff report, I'm hoping what you see now, shows it correctly uh, as to where all the tracks are. Brian, how much frontage do you have on Western? 340, I think it's 347 feet. We will maintain the 200 foot separation because we know that road, we know Pawnee Drive, at least going to the west, will happen someday. Um, so we're gonna, make, we're gonna maintain that we have that. And I've agreed to the staff that we will do that. I agree with Stuart that we will keep the 200 foot. Now the person, the party that owns the land you're talking about or who has sold it to you, whichever is the case, also owns the land to the north he up to? Land, he owns the land to the north. There's another potential buyer for that. Like I said, we started with them first. That's probably been six to eight months ago. We started doing layouts for that potential owner to the north. Before we even knew anything was happening where the top, I was called Top Golf, Chisholm Creek, whatever you want to call it. So the road could happen someday on our side. Um, it's just not yet. These, our, our contract is for the land you see. And again, we will make sure we maintain that 200 feet. Um, trying to think of what else uh, to bring up with you guys now. I'll be glad to answer your questions um, if you have any. Oh, we met with the church. Uh, we met with the church last week with the pastor and his board. They were really in favor of it. One thing I do want to add, and we can put it in as additional tea, we're going to add trees on 25, evergreen trees on 25-foot centers along the south side of the first building. 
they were concerned about fences and what they would see. And as we talked through the meeting, I said, I think, would you rather have green and trees or would you rather have a hard wood fence? And they agreed that they'd rather see trees. We will still have a fence there. There's a barbed wire fence there now. Uh, but we're still going to want, they're going to want no one to go between the properties. Um, so we will have a fence, or that, probably just to remain the current fence, but we'll put up additional landscaping on the south. Again, we've, we're going to try to meet with Mr. Cooper. I think he's had some surgery just recently, and obviously your first meeting. Uh, we met with uh, uh, the council person. He was all in favor of it. And like I said, our neighbors, we met with them, and they really liked what they saw. So we glad to answer any questions you have. JJ? Just real quick regarding the TEs. On, on the detention, we're not saying we want a statement in the PUD that says detention will be required. We just don't want a statement that says it won't be. That's fine. That's fine? That's fine. Okay. Uh, TE5, we're fine with that as long as it's limited to directional and informational signs. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I guess we need probably to amend 7 to require that minimum 200 foot separation. Yes. Agreed. But that does not necessarily mean that Pawnee Drive will line up, right, Brian? No. Well, but it may. Your drive will line up with Pawnee. Our drive? Yeah. No, because we don't own land far enough north we can't. to get to Pawnee Drive. Pawnee Drive on the current new PUD is, is, see where it says PUD 1515? Yep. That's about where that is. It comes out north of us. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yes, it may extend to these some. But what you're saying is you'll make you'll make maintain the separation between your drive and wherever Pawnee Drive is. Yes, and I've already talked to their engineer. I know all their geometry of where their roads are going to be. So I'm very I'm being really careful with that. So we'll okay. make sure we maintain the two hundred. Yeah, their road is coming. We just don't know quite when. Right. But we know where. Okay. All right. Pretty much. Pretty much, and that's yeah, that's another deal too. Pretty much. Chairman, yes. Said, but their property does not back up the Pawnee Road. Is that correct? That's correct. Somebody, somebody owns the property in between you and Pawnee Road. If Pawnee Drive were to go straight through, our north property line would line up with where that will be. So we are not creating a gap if Pawnee Drive kept going straight east. Pawnee Drive may come into the property and turn. We don't know. But there will not be a gap between us and that, in that intersection when it happens. And you're also willing to add the TE. I did speak with uh, uh, Pastor Jones, and um, they are, are pretty adamant about the landscaping. Absolutely. You're willing to add that to? Uh, Absolutely. Okay. And, and the correct and the wording we're putting in is evergreen trees on 25-foot centers south of that first building. Yes, sir. Okay. Stand right. No one signed up. I don't think. Nope. Mr. Chairman, yeah. we uh, move for adoption. Okay. With the uh, addition of a TE for the landscaping, landscaping, and deleting TE five. Yes. Uh, TE five is the uh, directional sign. Right. We're keep. Yeah. You're keeping the TE, but say the leave the TE in and, yeah. and add directional. Right. The leading TE seven. Okay. Second. Second. Right. Okay. We have a motion and a second to right. approve right. item 15 as condition. Cast your votes, and it's approved. Thank you. Item 16 is PUD 1546 to rezone 1000 North Check Hall Road from R1 to PUD 1546. Good afternoon, David Box, 522 Colcord Drive. Here on behalf of the applicant, I also have with me uh, Jim Griffith, Dennis Silvers with RQ, Muhammad Khan with SMC, and Michael Hoffner with TEC. What we have I can't is. I see any of them. They're all hiding behind your screen. I want you guys to be able to see them. Sure. <laughs> They've got good faces. There we go. Oops. Well. Almost. Now we're talking. All right. What we have is a, a I won't say unique, but a strange piece of property. Now, that's right. Read what I handed to you before then you used the word I, unique. I, I caught myself. Um, a piece of property that uh, for years and years has been uh, nothing more than uh, oil and gas site with tank batteries. And it's because it lies in an area where it's uh, right off the off-ramp from a major highway. And, 
right along 10th Street, which is a major arterial. So what we have is an opportunity for OnQ, which um, I believe, in my opinion, is the best uh, gasoline uh, sales operator that we have in this market. They have beautiful facilities. Um, I think everyone at this point is uh, familiar with the facilities that they have, but just in case, we do have some renderings. All their facilities are clean, top-notch. As you know, they all have the canopies that, that overhang all the way to the actual convenience store. Um, we think it'll certainly be an addition to this area. Um, there were just a couple of TEs that I'd like to address. Um, on TE number two, we're fine with deleting the outdoor sales and display, but we do want to make sure that you know things like red box and propane sales and water and pop that you normally see outside of a firewood, right, firewood outside of a gas station. As long as that's considered accessory, um, we don't need the outdoor as a, a separate use unit, but we we do want the ability to do all those things you see at convenience stores now. Um, the TE that addresses the separation requirement, we would ask that that be deleted. Uh, Michael Hofter is here to, to address it if need be, but we meet all separation requirements for the City of Oklahoma City. Uh, we meet all site distance requirements for the City of Oklahoma City. Uh, we firmly believe that having two access points on 10th is important, uh, not only to our internal circulation, but also to traffic onto 10th Street. So you don't have queuing up in our lot, and you don't have queuing up along 10th Street. Um, as I said, Michael Hoffner is here to address it, but we meet each and every requirement within the code for Oklahoma City. So we would ask that the E2 to be deleted. Is there a possibility that uh, you consider a write-in and write-out at that uh, westernmost access point on 10th Street? Dennis, what I'm understanding David, from the staff yeah, we talked to Stewart about that, and he said the concern is it concern is it the, up the left turn lane. There's five, how many? 500? There's 500 at peak hours. There's 500 uh, cars turning uh, left south off of 10th Street, down south on Check Hall Road. Okay. We, we the concern to... is uh, that you wind up blocking what would need to be a second left-hand turn lane there on 10th Street to accommodate that traffic. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll let the engineer address it. We, we did try to visit with Stuart. We're not unable to do so. So this is the first we're, we're hearing of this. Yeah, let, me, let, me, let me understand. We're concerned about the peak hour requirement of the left turn lane, and yet they meet all of our our standards and our sub rate. But because five o'clock traffic comes, we're going to kill an entire entrance for the That's, other. We're not, no, 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 we're, we're not, not killing it. Kill the entire entrance. We're, his, his issue is that if people are coming, and Stuart's in the room now, if people are exiting uh, the on queue there during that heavy traffic. Yeah, they can't. They want to turn. They're going to want to turn left, and they're going to take up and block one of the two left turn lanes coming off of 10th going south, which basically cuts off half the capacity of the intersection for left hand turns. Is that, but does that T correct, Stuart? But well, the T I'm I'm con still confused. The TE says the minimum 200 foot separation between the driveway on Check Hall and Northwest 10th must be maintained. Right. And when I look at the, the diagram, I look at Check Hall, and it's over 200 feet both ways. So I, I guess I don't understand the TE. Well, let's Stuart explain it then. Okay. Well, the, the issue is not so much drive, meeting the, uh, the subdivision regs for driveway separations from a street to a driveway. It's an issue of maintaining access to the westbound left turn lane, which will get you know people in that area to I-40 going down Check Hall Road. I'm going to I'm going to come step over here and use their diagram. This left turn lane in proximity to this driveway right here. We've had a lot of issues in the past where we've got convenience stores. There's one over at the intersection of uh, Tense. Uh, Mustang Road in Reno, we had con a convenience store that's got a driveway that's somewhat opposite or adjacent to a left turn lane. And a lot of times what you see happen is you will see vehicles slow and then will want to turn in. They'll use that lane and what it does is it deprives other people behind them from being able to get access into that left turn lane. 
And at a location like this where we've got, you know, a left turn lane that's serving right now close to 500 vehicles an hour during the peak hour in the afternoons, something like this would ordinarily, once you get above 300 vehicles an hour, we should ordinarily be looking at utilizing something like a dual left turn, and right now we've just got a single. So the, pur the purpose for our comments is to try and preserve as much access to users of that left turn lane as is possible. So what's your proposed solution? Well, an alternative that you could look at if they want to, if, you know, it could be elimination of that driveway, it could be re relocation further to the east, or you could potentially look at using, uh, making that like a right in, right out, so it doesn't have the left turn interference. Well, we would, I mean, the, the traffic study showed no adverse impact to any of the arterials. What the location of this does is it, it significantly helps and, and benefits our internal circulation because folks would come in here and go straight down to the drive through And if they can't turn left into here, then they're coming in here and we're creating more points of conflict there. There was nothing in the traffic study to suggest what staff is asking for. So, Just to say, I'm, I'm still well, not understanding. I'm sorry. You're saying people are going to come out on, on the 10th Street out of on queue, make a left, and then make another left to go down? No, what we're trying to do is we're trying to, main, we're trying to preserve the capacity, that left turn lane capacity on 10th Street by the time you reach Check Hall Road. Mm -hmm. if, if vehicles are stopping on 10th Street before getting into that left turn lane because their destination is to use the on queue, then what they're doing is they're potentially blocking access to people who want to go continue over to Check Hall Road to make their left turn. Mm -hmm. Because you've got so, oncoming eastbound so, traffic. So what, at the, this distance back to this entrance from Chuck Hall is, I can't, can't read it. I don't have a magnifying glass. But about it's 345 feet. About 300 feet. feet. So you're saying, right. you're saying that we're going to have stop people 300 feet back from making a left on Chuck Hall to go south. They're going to have to wait for me to turn left into on queue. Well, what we're trying to do is we're trying, we're trying to make sure that we don't have any, any slowdowns in that westbound direction. It's not so much, it's not so much an issue of the separation. Block. I mean, I, okay, I understand. Just so I'm clear on the traffic, on the west side of the property, right, that entrance, that's no, on the uh, north-south road. On check hall, that's two way. In other words, your people can exit right and go right. In other words, you could exit on the check hall, go north, and then go back to the east. Is that right? Correct. The, the traffic allow the roads allow for that. Yes, sir. Yes, so, like this. I mean, to your point about your internal circulation, I, I, I mean, I know you want as much circulation as you can get, but a right in, right out, you still have access to get back if you were to consider that to go back to the east using the check hall entrance. The other problem I see is that you can see the in this exhibit the, the Q lane for the turn doesn't even start until quite a bit after the, the, the entrance that's at issue. But, but David, yeah. don't you have another driveway to the east? Two. We have well, two on. I understand, but I'm just going one east of this one that we're talking about. Yes, sir. So if I'm, if I'm westbound on 10th Street and I want to turn left into on queue, Stuart, you're suggesting I'm going to go to the third on queue entrance to turn left? It's always an, it's an option. Pardon? It, currently, the way it's, with it being a two-way driveway, it would be an option for you. It would be an option. Right. But let's... And, and that option would, would keep people from hitting this Q lane that David just talked about. But the, I would submit to you the vast majority of people are going to take one of these first two, two lefts into on Q. So if I stop back here, I'm still restricting those people from behind me unless they get in the right lane and go around me. Uh, I don't get it. I, I'm sorry. I, I don't. I, I'm not a. Uh. So you've done a traffic study. 
Yes, sir, and, to, and I'll have Mr. Hoffner speak, but to your point, we're actually striping, as part of this project, a left turn lane that's not presently there for this entrance. David, I understand, but what, when I look at the, your deal, there's, there's three ways. If I'm westbound on 10th Street, there's th two. The, the third one that shows up is uh, an oil field entrance. That's not part of this. There's two. It's these two okay. for the on-cue. Okay, but, but the, I can't figure out why I would not do the first one, why I wouldn't make my left at the first one. And I frankly can't figure out if that's such a problem that people are already in that lane to turn left and catch the queue to turn left on Chuck Hall, I'm still going to impede their pro progress. Because if I have to wait to turn left back here another three or four hundred feet, what's the difference? Well, our goal in making the comment is just to try and minimize any interference that may occur. Because I'm sure the left turn lane there is, in addition to that location being, you know, warranting the use of a dual westbound left turn, I'm sure that the storage bank, storage length in that lane already isn't adequate for the current traffic demands. And we're just trying to, we're just trying to minimize as much driveway related interference as may possibly exist. Could I, could I ask you a question, David? On my map, yes, my site plan here, um, between the two entrances that you show, in sort of in one bold relief, there's a little kind of faint little entrance there. And I wonder what that is. Is it something that's existing that you're going to take out, or? It's almost as faint as the one right. further. West. Uh, Mohammed Khan, 815 West Main, Oklahoma City. Uh, what you're seeing, the kind of sliver of that drive approach, it'll be, these are existing driveways. And so you're going to remove finished. those and replace right. them with these others? We're only proposing two driveways along 10th Street. The very east driveway, which is currently kind of shown, it'll be closed as well. Uh, I'd just like to clarify one more thing. The city code requires 120 feet separation between arterial to arterial, driver separation from intersection. We are providing 345 feet, almost three times than what is required there. Right, and, that, and that's, you know, I understand that that's, that's being complied with, but it's still not necessarily the best location for a driveway of that type. Driveway separation doesn't look at what happens on the main line road. It, it's totally the, independent of that. The, the, the traffic study also shows that the by addition of this development on this slide, uh, does not adversely impact the development. Uh, however, I agree that the uh, lanes are operating at peak level. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Michael and I are shaking our heads over Stuart's statement that, that the driveway separation requirements don't take into consideration what's happening on the mainline road. And if that's true, it just seems um, incomprehensible. Um, I mean, it seems like it ought to, perhaps, take that into consideration. I totally understand what Stuart is saying and, and that they're shooting for a best case scenario in a situation that they were already identified as inadequate. But on the other hand, um, it's, it's one of those things that if we need more stringent requirements, perhaps we should get them into place. We can't expect um, engineers and developers to read our minds uh, with respect to you know, what would be better in the future, perhaps. Um, but I, I, if there is a way to redesign the site, to move the, to move the driveways, uh, further to the east, I'd be all in favor of that. But if it's, if, uh, you know, I don't know enough about it from an engineering standpoint to know whether it's possible. It's way above my understanding. Where's the review of the traffic study? Well, and the traffic study doesn't have a problem. Well, yeah, I'm, that's what I'm not understanding. Is that correct? Yes, uh, the findings, Michael Hoffner, um, 6,000 Southwestern with Traffic Engineering Consultants. 
Um, yeah, the findings of the traffic study were that there, there is an existing issue where, where that is operating at capacity today, but that the additional traffic from, from the on queue that we projected does not adversely affect the conditions that are, that are existing today. So um, the driveways all operate fine. Uh, there, there is one um, a little bit of delay on the left turn out of the uh, driveway to Check Hall Road. But typically what we find is with additional access points, as the discussion was going a few minutes ago, people will reroute themselves to, to an easier um, point to gain access to an arterial. So, so what, Thank you. Michael, what's the, the level of performance of that intersection during peak hours? Uh, at Check Hall Road, Road and 10th Street, I believe it's F today. I can grab the study real quick. I'm sorry. Well, how can we make the statement that any additional traffic is not going to adversely affect it? It's not going to, you're saying well, it's not going to go to F minus? Well, let me, <laughs> let me, let me clarify that statement. <laughs> well, that's in, in essence, well, the way we operate is by level of service. Um, if we take a, a degradation of the level of service, uh, let's say D is generally acceptable. If it is D today and we add traffic to it and it's still a D, that would warrant the statement that I just made. However, I do agree it would add some delay in, you know, around the intersection. So my statement was, entire, was not entirely clear. Let me go to our summary table here. But Michael, you said it's operating at level F? Let me, let me verify that okay. just before I make that statement. Okay, uh, today it's operating at C during the A and peak hour and an E during the PM peak hour overall. Um, when we look at the 2015 total traffic, it's a D, and a D in the AM peak hour and an E in the PM peak hour. Okay. And, and then to help put that in a little bit of context, what we are seeking to do by either by eliminating or regulating the use of that driveway, we're trying to make, you know, best preserve what we have until we, until there's such time that, you know, that intersection can be expanded for dual left turn lanes. So what you're doing, suggesting, is you're asking the developer for some help here in, in essence? In essence, yes. That's, that's, what, that's what I hear. Help of what sort? To, to improve the intersection or um, no. to delay the opening of the access point until the intersection? is improved. No, not necessarily. I was about to say, because an alternative, if that driveway space, all we're, what we're trying to do is because we know that during the, during the evening peak hour that there's about, there's just under 500 left turns an hour occurring in that westbound direction headed south on Checkall Road. And the single left turn lane that we have right now, that's out there at the intersection right now, does not adequately handle that traffic movement. I mean, it's, it's oversaturated. And so what we're trying to do is remove any source of potential conflict or interference by either not putting in that one dri the driveway closest to Check Hall Road, or having it maybe potentially restructured as a right in, right out, where it doesn't have any influence from people who are westbound on 10th Street. It just eliminates it from conflict, from having any influence. Stuart, right now, can I turn left on Check Hall out of the uh, center westbound lane of 10th? Can you turn left out of Check Hall from out of the Westbound center, center westbound lane. No, on the 10th Street, a double turn lane. Is it a double turn lane right just, now? Yeah, it's just a single left turn lane currently. Can you make it a double? The roadway would have to be widened. Yes. Well, I know there's we, not enough roadway out there right example, now. For example, we've done that on on Meridian mm -hmm. and Memorial. We've made them double uh, only after I called. Uh, no road construction, okay. and I was just asking. I, you know, I didn't go out there and measure it, but, but. About the only way you could do that, you'd have to sacrifice one of the westbound through lanes. Well. And that'd be, it would be an awkward situation because people that are. I'm not saying dedicated right. to left turn. I'm saying you have two lanes going west, right? Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. The far left lane of those two lanes, or the south lane, can it also make a left on the check hall? In, in addition to the people turning left out of the turn lane, like you've done at Meridian it, and Memorial, it probably could be done, but it would require that it would it would prevent you from running east and westbound traffic on 10th Street at the same time. 
you have to basically what we call split the phases. Eastbound traffic would always move separately. But if that was the case, well, then you could have. Your eastbound you have traffic's tool. moving separately when you're turning left out of that left turn lane. But your but your eastbound and westbound through phases can, can come on together on 10th Street. What you're do what to do something like that would permanently sever that. No, you, you're not seeing what I'm saying. Oh. If I'm making a left on Check Hall out of the left-hand turn lane right now. A left from 10th Street onto Check Hall? Yeah, right. Okay. I have a green arrow there to do that, which stops eastbound 10th Street traffic, doesn't it? Yes. So at the same time, if I'm running west, I have two westbound lanes, westbound, and out of that center westbound lane, can I, is there enough room for me to also make a left turn? Well, right now the intersection's only got enough width for, to accommodate two eastbound lanes, two westbound through lanes, and a no, single left turn I'm lane. I'm taking a left on check hall. I'm not making an extra left turn lane, a dedicated turn lane. Are you familiar with Memorial Road and yes. Yes. westbound yeah. Memorial Road? Mm -hmm. I have two lanes going right. west. Right, we've made those. And I have a left turn lane, right? I can turn left out of that that center left westbound lane, can I? Yes, you can. But but there is no there's no, there's no traffic, traffic in the other I direction. I understand. Now that's what makes that possible. Now go back to another intersection where there is eastbound traffic, and we do that. We coordinate. We let the people go that direction. In this case, west. When the left turn lane is on, Correct. okay, and we're, we're stopping the eastbound traffic not to let that center lane turn left, but to let the left turn people turn left, okay? Okay. That's all I'm asking. Is that possible? With widening, yes. In this case, yes. Why does it need to be widened? It's already a four-lane road. Well, because you've got, you've got the same number of lanes in the opposing direction. You, You'd be, you'd be talking about, re, about basically making the, what we would call, call lane one westbound, which would be, I'm going to go back to the drawing. About, this lane would be, this is already dedicated for left turns only. You're talking about making the next lane over available for left turns as well? I'm uh, available to go straight or turn left. Not dedicated left, but just straight or left. Well, that, that would really, that that well, I'm just asking yes, Stuart, if it's possible. It's, it is possible. Um, Stuart is correct in the, from this respect that it would have to be operated from a split phase operation because you would still have to stop that eastbound traffic because with that inside lane being a shared, shared uh, lane, you're going to have a mixture of through and left turn vehicles. So if you get the first vehicle in that queue wanting to go through, they're blocking that whole lane. Um, if you got two left turn vehicles in that lane and then two or three through vehicles, the two through can turn, I mean the two left turns can make the left turn and then the through vehicles have to get up there and stop because they want to go through. If you, if you run a dedicated left turn phase. It's on. not a dedicated, I'm, ne never mind. I'm sorry, you guys, <laughs> I'm not communicating and we've spent too much time on this. Oh, but but there's, there's a problem. There's a problem that we can't solve with this dialogue about how to fix the the the, 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 the log jam on Check Hall Road going west and what turn lanes there are. That has to be resolved between traffic and these guys. I can't. Why do we ask for Why do we ask for a traffic report? Well, for this reason. Okay, but the traffic report says we don't need what Stewart's proposing. Well, and that's all we're saying is we, we far exceed what the code requires. We're way above the traffic report. Well, then, <laughs> if I may, um, I think, look, we've offered a proposal, a semi-proposal, to make that entrance a right-in, right-out. If you don't want to do it, I get it. We think it would create more of a problem. We, we'd prefer not to do it. Is that a yes or no? Th that's a no. Okay, thank you. That's, that, that narrows the issues down for there us. You go. I, I get it. So now. the question before us then is, do we want to vote on Look, I think everybody's fine with this application. 
with the operators. I, I learned my lesson on my Northwest Expressway. These guys are great <laughs> operators. Uh, I got it. And so the point is, oh, there is one point, though, in addition to this traffic issue, and that was one that was raised with respect of the sewer service, right? You're either taking your sewer, and I, I'm not the one that can probably address it. Would you come? Go ahead and come up. That way we get the point said properly. Okay. Nathan Madenwald, Utilities Department. Um, we had agreed to let them get sewer service from the city of Yukon back in 2004. We're still okay with that. We just haven't, got, haven't had a chance to talk with Yukon, haven't had an updated conversation from the engineer regarding Yukon. We just need to have something in place to make sure that they're going to be able to be served until such time Oklahoma City sewer is available. Okay. Uh, once again, Mohammed Khan. The existing sewer line, uh, the sewer line was built specifically to serve this property. The sewer line is already there. The action was passed by the city council for the city of Yukon to serve this property for sanitary sewer services. The sewer line was accepted by the public works department. Uh, the city utility director, Ms. Marsha Slaughter, mm -hmm. she accepted the idea and they also agreed to let the city of Yukon serve this property for sewer service. With all these things in place, we didn't feel like it, that there is a need for a fresh commitment from city of Yukon to satisfy Nathan's request. And we, we would like to have something in there that they either connect the city of Yukon or connect the city of Oklahoma City. And if everything moves forward with Yukon, then we're fine. So let me ask a silly question. Yes, sir. Would we allow them to open the business if it wasn't hooked up to a sewer? <laughs> we will have sewer. Uh, is this really an issue? I guess is my question. You know, I think it's a big the, the These thing. stations are all around town. I, and I bet you that this intersection has got less traffic than uh, Douglas and 29th Street. Yeah, it's it got up less traffic than 39th and, and Wilshire. I, <laughs> I don't see the problem. Nor do I. But that's, but, and I don't see a sewer issue here. That, I guess that's what I'm saying. It's practically speaking, you're going to have to hook up to sewer. And yes, I, I think it should be resolved, and I'm sure you guys will resolve it, but... Our toilets will flush. To a sewer main. To a sewer main. In an approved method, because we can't authorize somebody to connect to Yukon. Oklahoma City cannot do that. I understand. We have to have something in place. So I just wanted to make it clear that if... But Yukon Oklahoma City could preclude them from operating operations if they weren't hooked up. Um, do I? They couldn't get a CEO, could they? No, but I just want to make sure that the applicant's aware that if they don't get connected to Yukon, they've got to extend Oklahoma City sewer. Utilities Department can't do that. The developer will do that. It's That's a reasonable point. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Go for it, Mike. Wait, I've got another issue. Go ahead, Bob. The, oh, the, the depiction on what you handed out, David. Yes, sir. Of the signage. This. The signs yet. This, oh, this, I thought we were signing it. Ready to gloss motion. over it. <laughs> I wanted to cut him off short before he made a motion. Uh, the the size of signs. Would you explain what they all are? Yeah, I sure can. Because um, it's different than what it is that's in the application. No, it's exactly what's in the application. Um, Unless I can't read the small print. Well, I won't comment on that. Uh, <laughs> That may be true. <laughs> How tall is the pylon sign, which I would characterize as a pole sign? It's 50 foot. And it's not 50 foot because we just picked a random number. Random number. I'll address one part of that, and then I'll have Mr. Griffith uh, address another part of it. What we did was commission a sign study. And the sign study is based on the ability to see a sign, safely move over to the lane you need to exit, and exit the highway. Uh, this, this illustration depicts uh, the viewer location from here, which would allow him safe opportunity to get to the exit lane here, and here would be the sign location. So this, this is a shot from where, what this guy's looking at from here, and you can see, because of the overpass of Check Hall, you're barely able to see, all you'll see is this right here, the on-cue and the gasoline prices. And so it was picked for the reason because we have the overpass. On this, 
on this that you handed out, mm -hmm. tell me about the other pylon sign on the northwest corner. Uh, that one up there. Oh, I don't. I don't necessarily consider that a, a that, pylon that, sign. But, no, the but one this to is the left, the, that one. Yeah, that's the sign that uh, OnQ has uh, on all their products all over right. the city. And that's a that's a a tw twenty foot sign or twenty one foot. It's a little taller than that. Um, we'd be willing so to drop it to twenty point eleven point five or something like that. Yeah, that's the uh, that's the the area of the actual signage part. The height is approximately thirty. Talk to my client, and they're willing to make that, that sign. Does that point. have to be 30 feet high? Why couldn't it be 15 feet? Because you've got the neighborhood to the north, Yukon, and having that shining in their eyes, 30 feet tall, I see no reason for it to be that tall at that location. We're not dealing with sight distances on the highway going either one, either way. You're dealing with Check Hall Road and Northwest 10th Street. Yeah, what we've got is uh, a situation up and down 10th Street where we have signs that are much taller than what I mean, we'll drop it to the 20 the reader board is is at the bottom of it so it'll be less than what you see you know out here okay. um, in you <laughs> you know you're, these are the poster child for what I'm talking about the other signs that you're competing with this this is a different animal these are good I agree with so this Mr. Hensley this you you do a good design but there's no reason to inflict a signage that's real high, that has shining lights to a neighborhood to the north. I agree, and that's why we're well, willing bring to get it, 20 bring feet. Well, bring it down to 15 feet and you're fine. There's no reason for it to be that big. You can't miss it. This covers a square block. We need the 20 feet on that northwest. I mean, it's... Pardon? We need the 20 foot, I mean, which is dropping at 12 feet from what we had proposed. Well, that's better than nothing. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm just trying to get some, because this, this route on I-40 back and forth with a number of pole signs that are just, just silly. I understand why they need to have visibility. I just think that like the McDonald's sign you have right there, it's so far up in the sky, it breaks your neck to try to see it. You know, so you can't miss this on the interior streets. And so if you would just drop it down, I'm fine with that. And I'll give you the 50-foot sign. I mean, well, I'm not going to argue against it because I understand, you know, overpasses and visibility, et cetera. But bring it down on the interior part. I'm short. <laughs> okay. I'm Crystal Van Tile with Insignia Signs, 809 Southeast 83rd. The reason why we were saying 20 fit is because they've got so many gas products that they're trying to advertise, okay, along with the name of this business, mm -hmm. on cue, and then they do an LED message center. There's not, they'll only have like a pedestal of two to three foot on the bottom if we go to 20 fit. If you go to 15, you're not going to be able to get all of the gas products on there at a size that you can read. Can, can you go to 20 foot and get the, get the it's, it's hard if to If we read go it. to 20 foot overall height, then yeah. we can make that work. Let's do it then. But not 15. Fine. Okay. Okay. Do it. Okay. Right, I thanks. think we're okay with TE number one. So, we are. <laughs> I'm tired. I want to go home. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'll make a motion to approve the application. With the deletion of TE3. The deletion of TE3, right? Because you've got, just because you've got more, I mean, it, it was, you've got more than that already, right? So do you need to delete the TE? We, yeah. There's a minimum. So, one the, 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 delete the second sentence the, with respect to the Western driveway, right? Yeah, the issue is that the number that is put forth in the TE is arbitrary. We far exceed the Oklahoma City standards. 200 feet. There's no basis for that 200 foot number that was put as a TE. The the regs are 120 or 140, which we far exceed that. I understand. All right. We have an objection to that deleting too. Okay. And 20 feet on the far no far west on Checkall. Far west on Checkall. Sign. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve item 16 as condition. Cast your votes. 
It's approved. Thank you. Item 17 was continued. Item 18 is C-6586, the preliminary plat of Hefner Woods on the Lake, located east of Kelly and north of Hefner Road. Anybody need a break before we continue? Ten minutes. Yeah, we'll take a ten minute break.
We submit, haven't we submitted that to you? I got the copy of the plan, but not a PDF. It's put on the stand. No, it's all right. by the number of phone calls. No, I don't email. You know, I, so we started... We okay, we are back in session and ready for item 18. Bobbery? Again, this is the preliminary, preliminary plat of Hefner Woods on the lake. David? Thank you. David Box, 522 Colcord Drive, here on behalf of the applicant, Sabi Khalidi, who is also with me, and Brandon and Barry Lodge. This is the plat of uh, a PUD that was recommended for approval two weeks ago. And this is a plat that's had uh, multiple modifications, a lot of work with uh, Planning Commission, a lot of work with staff. I want to thank all of you for, for taking time to, to meet with us. And Dr. Cooper, thank you for uh, just being appointed Tuesday and, and jumping in and, and meeting with us last night. We certainly appreciate it. Uh, the end result of all that work is what we think a, a great product. Um, we have connectivity throughout. Um, we've shortened block lengths. We have uh, an enormous amount of open space, a lot of amenities. And what we have is, uh, again, I'm going to say unique, but a unique opportunity to connect everything with about two and a half miles of walking trails. So what we've shown you in this exhibit, what you see in green is common area open space. What you see in blue are common area open space, but where we will have specific amenities. And rather than just using the land that we can't use as, a, as an open space, um, we still showed the other type of open space uh, as hatched lines. So we feel like we, we have significant meaningful open space, and we also have an opportunity to have two unique concepts within this development. Uh, this is the same thing we showed you within, or with the PUD, where you have these neighborhoods like the, the Edinburgh neighborhood. And uh, those are where the variances come from in the staff report. Uh, we need a variance for paving widths and uh, design standards. Uh, the other variance deals with interconnection with uh, quarter sections. But we think uh, what you have now before you is something that's going to be a, a great development. It's going to be a, a certainly a, a development with more open space than I've seen uh, in a long time. And we would ask for your approval. We're here to ask, answer any questions you have. David, point of clarification. I can't really see very well up there, but does that show the lots split that we talked about? I've, I've got two different no. drawings in front of me. That, that is a, an older one. What you have in front of you, that is not right. What okay. you have in front of you that I we, just... The change we spoke of, you've yes. made. Yes. yes. Thank Which you. is reflected on this. That is correct. Yeah, I had two, and they were just different. It, it, Due to the hour of uh, this meeting, um, we would like some 30, 40 foot sign somewhere. No, I'm just kidding. Discussion, commissioners? Oh. Chairman, I've talked about this with the applicant and the developers, and I think that what with all the revisions that have been done over the period of time, uh, it's a unique property with existing roads that were already there. What? <laughs> it's a, what? a joke between David. The word "unique," which the boxes always use, you know, every, use every application's unique. I use that. You just use the word oh "unique." Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> and, Sorry. And, and we made eye contact. It's just, but as you say, it's late. 
But it, but it is. And it, 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 it adapts an existing two developers before roads or whatever, and with the two gated communities and how they're put together, how those are done. Uh, I move approval. Uh, do we have variances? Yes, sir. And I did forget to mention one thing. On TE7, um, Utilities Department, Mr. Uh, Manuel did ask that rather than um, it reading must be shown as a public utility easement, he would request that we show uh, must be shown as a public sanitary sewer easement. There's a minor point of clarification. All right. Um, Yes, we have three. Three, 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 three from I move approval of the variance on TE3. We have a motion and second to approve the variance on TE3. Cast your votes. That's approved. Move approval of the variance on TE4. Motion to approve variance TE4 with a second. Cast your votes. We move approval of the variance of TE5. Motion and second to approve the variance TE5. Cast your votes. Uh, we move for the application with the exception of TE7 to add. We're to delete. Delete utility and replace it with sanitary sewer. Yeah, that, with that. We have a motion and a second to approve item 18, modifying TE7. Cast your votes. That's approved. Thank you very much. Thank you. So far, so good. Item 19 is C6602, preliminary plat of the vintages at Camden Park, located south of northwest 164th and west of Western. Tom Gravitt, I'm the applicant. Uh, 1312 Northwest 172nd Street. Would you like to know what the first word on my sheet of paper is? David, you'll appreciate this. It is unique. What we're presenting before you is a preliminary plat that goes with the PUD that you approved two weeks ago. Um, it's quite coincidental that we come behind uh, Mr. Cleedy's plat, and what we're proposing is, is modeled after the same subdivisions that he's looking at, both Murfield Village and Edinburgh. Um, the unique position that we have is that uh, we are working with the developer of those projects, and he will be our, our exclusive builder. Um, what we are proposing uh, is a private gated community um, focusing on age 45 and above, empty nesters. Um, we've actually seen a lot of single professionals moving in these neighborhoods. And the things that they're looking for and what we've pro provided them are, one, they want to connect with those in the neighborhood that they live with. Um, two, it's real important to them to have beautiful parks and green belts. Uh, they want the ability to lock and leave. Um, and really what comes up highest on the list is walkability. And how we've addressed that are, are two common areas. This is a, I hate to say, an infill project on 164th and Western, but it really is. It's a little over 28 acres. Uh, we've provided over four acres of green space. Uh, and in that 28 acres, we've also provided and will have a little over a mile of walking trails. Uh, slash sidewalks in our uh, pedestrian walkway plan. Uh, and then when you connect on to 164th, you've got over four or five, six, eight square miles of, of uh, sidewalks, and I've had some discussions with, with those with you. The variances that we are seeking are, as David mentions, are in line with what has been done in the other projects. Uh, I don't know if you'd like me to address any specific variances with you. If you do, I'll be more than happy to, to talk about any of those with you. But we would ask that you approve the preliminary plat as, as we've presented it with the variances that, that we have. We do have someone signed up, Commissioners. You want you? Billy Alexander. I wonder who that could be, since there's only one person left. <laughs> yeah, one patient person. Can you give us your name and address, please? Uh, Billy Alexander, 3128 Stony Brook Road. Um, 
Well, I didn't know I was going to be here, first of all. And anyway, I guess I'm here to kind of gain some knowledge. Um, this development, I own a gas well, or I, have, I operate a gas well next to this development, and it has been brought to my attention that um, they want to come in on 55 to 65, 55 to 60 feet uh, from my wellhead on my location with a wall. Um, it's not going to give me enough room to have a rig in there to turn around. It's not going to give me enough room to tie down on my anchors. My, I've got anchors set up right now that are 90 feet uh, in four directions away from the wellhead. And you tie those anchors to a workover rig, which the mast on a workover rig is about 70 feet high. And those cables and the anchors are there to prevent that workover rig from falling over. Mm -hmm. um, the well was drilled in 55. Um, when the well was drilled, there were surface damages paid. Uh, paid to the landowner for use of this property for the ongoing operations of the well. Uh, hold on. Where, where is your well exactly? Um, from where they are, I guess I'm just to the east. Um, but I can't. I don't know what lot that is. I can't see. But Why? Um, I can sort of draw it now. I think. Uh, yes, right there. Yeah. That, yeah, that's where I would put it. Yes. Yeah. Where the hand is. Yes. Cursor. Um, several years ago, there was a House bill passed, House Bill 1569, um, better known as the Encroachment Bill. Um, the bill was passed to help oil and gas operators and service companies. As you can see, um, the bill states that you cannot have a habitable structure within 125 feet from the well or 50 feet from any oil and gas related uh, surface equipment, which would be an anchor. Um, and to my knowledge, I mean, maybe they can educate us or whatever, but just by this house bill alone, not just the surface that, I've, that came with the wealth in 55, but they're going to be closer with a home to the well. Where do, where do you gain access now? Do you come in off of Western or off of 100? Uh, off of Western. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I've, I've been down this road before, uh, and I believe, and Susan, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe, well, first of all, I don't think this is, this is our, our business, but that said, uh, it's my understanding of the deal that they can go ahead and develop their property. They just can't encroach on you within 50 foot of your dead man, I believe. That's to uh, my knowledge, yes. And, you know, again, that's a legal private matter between you guys, but I've seen this many times before, and I think that's the deal. So my guess is... As long as you're producing that well, unless they want to buy it out, uh, that little wherever they're encroaching that on that maybe I'll say that corner lot, lot 15, or the, maybe the one to the north of it, depending on where that little hand is, uh, they're just not going to be able to develop that until uh, you uh, plug and abandon that well. That's to my knowledge, that is correct. Uh, and but again, that's that's between you guys. Uh, not us. That's okay. as much as we can share with you. All right. Thank you for thank you for sitting through the meeting. Hey, thank you. We'll be more than happy to sit down and plan on visiting with him after we get approval of our preliminary plan. Yeah. Yeah. You you'll have to work that out one way or another. Correct. Correct. Any other questions from us? I'd, would you have comments on the TEs? I do. I can address those if you like. 
Pardon? I'll address yeah. those if you like. Yeah. Um, first of all, in regards to TEs 3 and 8, uh, which have to do with access into the subdivision. Um, all right. We yeah. do have over 100 lots. And the requirement is if you have over 100 lots, you have to have a se second entrance. What we've agreed with the fire marshal, and they've reviewed our plan, and if we made adjustments, they're okay with it. They like what we've done. We've added a total of three fire access points, mm -hmm. uh, two on 164th, one on the east, one on the west. And in the south portion, yeah. Yeah, that's good. It also addresses number eight. Um, number 12, which has to do with our pedestrian walkway plan, we would ask that you approve that in lieu of the requirements that they're seeking. And I'll let our engineer address the other TEs if you like. Do you meet all the rest of the, P of the TEs? Well, we need variances, Bob. We, uh, huh? we need about four variances that's on what this thing. Uh, again, you've noticed they're doing the same thing they did exactly. before. They bring us pictures of Edinburgh. <laughs> right. Do you, uh, do you agree to all the other T's except for what you said with respect to three? He'll review the other ones with you. And what's it, what else? Yeah, um, as Mike will need variances on three, five, six, seven, and eight. eight. Uh -huh. And I think you're in agreement with all the others. That is correct. And to overuse the word, I think this application is very unique. Uh, Bob, <laughs> uh, I, I believe the, the word may be unique you now. <laughs> Excuse me, Mr. Uh, yeah. Gales. Um, with respect to item number, tw TE number 12, we would also ask for approval of the pedestrian. Right. And you've covered that, I, I believe, if somebody else wants to talk about it. but. Okay, so we don't. Do we need a variance to three if we got these other? Yes, they, they say we do. I, I didn't think we did, but they're not streets, but they'll, they'll work. Access to the well, three is met. Well, I thought three was met when they did the two yeah. emergency accesses to the north and one to the south. But yet, uh, the, uh, I've been told they yeah, they still need a variance because the divided street <clears throat> doesn't extend 300 feet, and then oh. T and loop through the rest okay. of the development. Okay. All right. All right. I'll move variance TE3. All right. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the variance TE3. Cast your votes. It's approved. Move variance to TE5. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the variance TE5. Cast your votes. That's approved. Variance to TE6. Second. We have a motion and a variance to TE6. Cast your votes. It's approved. Seven. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the variance to TE7. Cast your votes. It's approved. And I'll move variance on TE8, even though uh, I don't think it's now necessary, but we'll do it anyway. Second. But those accesses said we're saying that we have an emergency access to the south. Right. To name the versus the street stuff. Right. So we just want to change that to say the emergency access to the south must be provided. Correct. Is that okay? That's fine. Fine. Yeah. A second. We have a motion and a second to approve the variance TE8. Cast your votes. That's approved. Move for the application. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve item 19. Cast your votes. Um, I, Wait a minute. We have one addition. Yeah. <laughs> It was just brought to my attention with respect to TE number six for the private access drives. An additional variance would need to be granted to be able on six too. to name those. Oh, to name them? Yes. yes. Uh, we've had a semantics problem whether these are drives or streets. And apparently, we, because now we're calling them drives and want to name them, we've got to have a variance. So, uh, do a variance on TE six. Second. A motion and second to approve the variance to T6 to give the drives names. Cast your votes. That's approved. And now I'll move approval of the application. Second. We have a motion and second to approve item 19. Cast your votes. That's approved. Thank you. 
Thank you. The rest of the items are continued. Um, Planning Commission committees, Planning Commission members. I want you to comment to uh, say welcome to my my new right side. <laughs> <laughs> Your new right hand man. <laughs> there you go. Well, uh, he better be my right hand man because the left is not doing too well today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next item is election of officers, chairman. Uh, I think a motion is necessary to waive provisions of the bylaws relating to the term of office of the chairman of the commission. Uh, so I so move. The motion is second to approve the the waiver. Cast your votes. It's approved. And now that that waiver has been accomplished, I nominate for the next year as chairman of the Planning Commission, John Yokel, and as vice chairman, Michael Hensley. Second. The motion is there a second? There was a second. Okay. Probably no one in seconds that one. <laughs> <laughs> Should I say that is unique? Yeah. <laughs> Guess your votes. That's approved. Um, Planning Department, Development Services, Municipal Counselor. There are no citizens, as we are not. Any other business? Motion to adjourn. We're adjourned at 4.52 p.m.